subjects actually. These come out by experience. Sometimes there are standards available throughout the world, but then it may not be part of a regular schedule of rates of the AP state or whatever it is, or it may not be a code may not be there. But then these come out by practice, by successful uh, practice of this now. So the next hours we spend actually on trying to understand these technologies. In these technologies, actually, it doesn't matter whether it is a mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, or a civil engineer at whatever level it is, because it just gives you some ideas, some issues which are tackled in course of time. Long, long ago, the World Bank, through one of its uh, wings, has assessed actually what is the loss to the universe or to the world, right, I say, both property and uh, man, uh, man and mankind, actually. And they find that the maximum loss to the world is actually due to uh, systems which you know reveal the droughts, the floods, and tsunamis and things. They are all the natural disasters. The second and most important uh, loss actually, commensurate with what we said earlier, is uh, something like uh, what we call as the black cotton soils. Now, in our own state, in the AP state and throughout our country, in fact, throughout the world now, we do face these issues actually. We do face issues and we continuously spend money uh, on uh, rehabilitating people. We have this uh, disaster mitigation force and we have so many organizations in the country which are help has occurred when a disaster has occurred. But then very little is being done to prevent the disaster. In this case, we have a lot of case histories right in our country. So what I'm going to present to you will be actually some of these typical case histories and the fundamentals of subject now. The subjects which I'm going to deal with are actually very vast. I've tried to simplify them to the extent possible. And uh, as we keep going through that now, I'm trying to look at the applications, actual applications, and the advantages are going to get out of it now, how we to mitigate disasters, and uh, both in terms of, uh, we can say, um, coastal erosion and river bank erosion. And also, effectively, we can use natural fibers like jute and coir, which are abundantly available in our own state, in the AP state. Just a minute, I'm trying to share the screen. Hello, everybody able to see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. So the first topic we are going to deal with is use of geosynthetics in coastal and riverine structures for erosion control. So what is it we are going to do? Is going to be look at what are the issues which are facing, and then also look at how we are going to solve it now. Now, all of us know, first we'll go to the other part of the country, Brahmaputra River. As you keep going along the river, actually, when the velocity of this water is very small in normal uh, stable season, you see this actually, how much cut is really there, and all of them are actually falling down as you keep going by the boat. And you can see there are multiple layers of the fine sand, the silt, and they keep dropping as you just go through the boat itself, actually. There's such a dangerous kind of thing. And later we'll see what are solutions you have given for this uh, preventing erosion through use of modern means, which includes, obviously, the use of uh, modern technology, that is uh, the geosynthetics. We also have the adage in Sanskrit and Telugu, we understand, 
Nadinam Sagrogatihi. That means every river actually finally gets into the ocean. That we know it. But then you go to Puri, we are somewhere around 10 kilometers from the Puri temple. And uh, come, yeah, you can say, come southward actually, there's a small rivulet actually. This is not a perennial river. Now, what is happening is, because when the river water is not there in the river now, it's because not perennial now, you can see the littoral drift has made actually close the mouth of this river actually. So when the river now started flowing by monsoon, obviously there no exit for this now. It starts almost flowing parallelly and find its own path to meet the sea. Now, obviously, all this area, the hotels, the quarters, and many things are totally disaster within a few kilometers length, actually. Now, how do you prevent this kind of disasters? How do you ensure that we are going to maintain the mouth of this now? And how do you ensure the production of these structures, actually? And also, if uh, rivers are, I mean, the, the sea is going to be in tsunami conditions, protect these banks, how to protect these coasts is going to be an issue. In fact, we will see one such case which has been done uh, by the state. Uh, there are many ideas which have been given for that now. We see that now, before this is the bank which are talking of, this road which are talking of, and this is the kind of beach you can say, this is the river which are talking of. And then also what the purpose originally was something submerged within 100 meters of the, you can say, beach. So it's not uh, available, it's not seen on the surface now. By putting a submerged structure, basically, they're able to prevent damage to the the coast or the beach. That is the kind of technology we have today. So these technologies, actually, the most modern technologies, use materials which are now called as geosynthetics. We can call them geosynthetic materials. And the use of this we can call as geosynthetic engineering. And uh, these materials, obviously, <coughs> can be used in every kind of civil engineering structure, either for new construction or for maintaining that now or for greater survivability. And these give us actually such durability that uh, this has to become actually a compulsory course in the in our civil engineering degree and of course in MTech also. Now, what is it we find is that these materials, because of the properties which they have actually, make them amenable to solve some of the functions which are going to be, uh, we can say, performed by these materials. So let us quickly see what they are and how we, how we think that they are so useful in the infrastructure development of the country both the development and the maintenance for sustainability, for durability, and also how these are going to be more economic structures also. And uh, for example, we have what we call a geotextiles, we have what we call geogrids now, and we have geomembranes, we have geocomposites. Actually, these are the four main categories. Whatever is shown in the red, actually, are the main categories. There are many other categories, like geonets also. They become part of the network, actually. So these four classes actually are the main categories which we are going to discuss. Now geotextiles themselves are cloth-like materials. They are somewhat like our suiting and shirting, like tarpaulin, you can say. Now the point is that they are of various colors also. They are of various kinds also. Let us see the two basic varieties of geotextiles, which are a woven geotextile, which looks like a shirting and suiting at a close level interval. And then what is it you are finding is that by virtue of uh, the material being made, for example, if you take a an electron microscope view of this now, you see that there are yarns. There are yarns. That means they are like threads, you can say, uh, naturally perpendicular to each other now. In a simple weaving process, we can do handloom also. Obviously, for natural purposes, they are going to use handloom kind of systems. But of course, they are machine made. But what is it you find is that when once you get the material, you see at the intersection now, there are openings basically. And then they are not so tight. Water can flow along also, water can flow across also. And particles which are finer than this opening size, naturally, they will pass through. Otherwise, they can also act as a filter now. Now, the strength of this material, if you take one meter width or one meter length now, can be as much as 1100 kilonewton per meter. 1100 kilonewton means actually by one meter width of cloth now, we can hang 110 tons weight. That means you can hang the two bulldozers actually, or three bulldozers also. So that is the kind of strength they have. And uh, the strength also depends upon what is the material the fibers are made of. The fibers, a number of fibers constitute a yarn actually. And uh, these fibers could be, let us say, um, polypropylene, which are generally slightly weaker than polyester. And also they can be also glass fiber, in which case actually the strength could be quite inordinate. And uh, depending upon the way we weave actually, depending on the number of fibers in each yarn, depending upon many other structural features of this when making the cloth actually, 
they perform many tasks. As I said now, they will be known for their strength in both these orthogonal directions. That means one along the roll and one across the roll. Than and Tangara. So along the than and across the than actually. And uh, by virtue of the kind of weaving we are going to have, how closely or how far away, and by the number of yarns we are having, uh, we are keeping in each yarn, and also the material naturally, we get strengths which are varying from a few hundred to more than 1000 kilonewton meter. The other important point we have to remember here in this case is that uh, the strength of this material is known in terms of load per unit width. Or it's not cross-sectional area because you know they are so thin material, it is difficult to measure its thickness change at failure. So it is defined in terms of a standard unit will be kilonewton per meter. Okay, that is something which we will keep discussing later. The other kind of material, so the earlier ones were called as woven geotextiles. The second variety is called as a non-woven geotextile. A non-woven geotextile is one which is like a blanket, basically, you know, when we cover yourself in uh, winter season, the blanket now, there are openings in that now, which will store air, air actually, and that will give the cushion effect as well as actually uh, the thermal effect. In the same case now, they are made actually by punching uh, fibers together, uh, process we will not have time to discuss. Uh, so, when once you look at again a scanning microscope view of this now, we find that these are made of, this non oven cell is made of actually, uh, at microscopically, so many openings of different size, different shape. This is what we call as a, a mechanically bonded needle punch non oven style. If you look at your non oven style, which could be dharmari bonded, you can see this again, so many kinds of openings and different size and different shape. And all of them actually now enable us two things. If you look at that means a thick one centimeter. So water can flow through these openings actually, in which case it will work like a drain. And then water can flow across this thin material. So naturally it will act like a filter. So we can compare this as a We will come to that when you go application of this one. So, a non-oven geotextile is going to function by virtue of its manufacturing capability as filter and a drain, depending upon what kind of opening size we are going to choose for this now, or what kind of opening size distribution we are going to pick up now. And then there are other materials which are called geogrids now. And what is it we find is that these geogrids again have openings of different uh, shape and different size. And you can see some of them are just square shape, some of them are, you can say, oval shape here now, some of them are exactly uh, kind of welded together now. In all these cases now, we have two broad varieties. One is a uniaxial kind of geogrid, and there is a biaxial kind of geogrid. Now, what is the difference between these two? These two have actually strength in one direction, major strength, other direction strength is going to be very, very limited. In these cases, uh, in a non oven geotextile, I mean, non oven geogrid, I mean, I'm sorry, biaxial geogrid, we have strength in both directions, almost similar order now. Now, what is it which is going to do? When you place it within a medium, of uh, aggregate or a soil, whatever it is now, naturally the stones or soil will get stuck into this now. So the strike through is going to give you a confining effect as you keep seeing it now, how this is going to involve actually uh, more strength of this entire thing. <clears throat> so this is what is going to happen. This is in actual grid, this is by actual grid now. So when you are trying to let us say, uh, place this uh, aggregate kind of material or stony kind of material and try to pull it out now. So you can't pull out so easily because in a case of geotextile, it's only surface friction between the particles and the geotextile, which is going to be uh, preventing from the pullout kind of thing. Here, naturally, the interlocking of these media into the openings is going to prevent this now. That means unless you move two, three particles on the top and at the bottom now, it's difficult to pull out. So the pullout capacity is going to be much more. This is used very effectively in actually doing a lot of structures like reinforced soil slopes and reinforced uh, soil walls, which you find many in the country and also in Vijayawada, going to everywhere. In the most of the national highways are actually are built using this kind of concept of actually reinforcing the soil to build reinforced soil structures. But that's not the topic here, so we will not spend much time on that. Before the advent of this uniaxial and biaxial geogrids, now there were these materials which are nets. These are actually being made, uh, I think, from 40 years ago, right in Gujarat itself, actually. <clears throat> now, what is the purpose of this? We thought the purpose of the same thing now. They also have openings now but the strength is very, very low. For example, if you talk of the strength of a uh, grid now, it could be up to a few hundred kilonewton per meter, whereas this will have hardly maybe three to seven kilonewton meter. So the strength is very, very small. They are they are obviously um, very, what do you call, very low in strength, 
but then they give space actually for the water to flow. We'll see how this is going to affect you in giving you more drainage facility also. So this is more like a spacer actually. And uh, when you go to the other material, which is membrane now, all our polythene bags that you use for shopping, they're all the same kind of thing. But then these are obviously anywhere from 0.5 to 2 millimeter thick now. They're very thick now. They are obviously essentially made of high density polyethylene or PVC. Uh, PE is more common in hazardous circumstances. PVC we use in uh, trying to also use in uh, water container structures. So the point is that they resist actually any penetration. That means they won't get damaged. You know, suppose you take a, you buy a kilo of aloo, and then you can puncture. I mean, if the, the kind of way packing it does is so thin film, basically you can simply put your finger and then it gets broken. Here it is going to be so strong and um, very good from pH 3 to pH 11. Naturally, they can withstand alkalis and um, uh, uh, acids also, and they are strong enough to take care of uh, the the damage during construction and also give a longevity. So these are obviously impermeable to water now. That means earlier we had a nano angiotestile which is highly permeable. It gives us both filtration and drainage. Here we got a structure, a layer, which is almost impermeable now. And so that is a membrane. A geomembrane is actually impermeable now. So the fourth category we mentioned is being made of what we got, made of the combination of the earlier materials into composites now. So for example, we have net here, we have nano geotestile here. In cross-section, it looks like this now. And then here we've got uh, again net, and on both sides, there are geotestiles. Now, if you try to see this now, the geotestile at the top and bottom, if you put the entire thing, the, the composite, is called a drainage composite, in water, let's say, in a slurry like this. So from the slurry, water can penetrate this nano geotestile, come into the center core, actually, and then move by gravity. So it is allowing, actually, the drainage of excess water in this slurry, slowly, slowly, to get consolidated. So in the same way, you don't want water to get out now. Naturally, there's a membrane which is sealed to this now. Here is the case now where we got a membrane and a net and, of course, a geotestile now. For example, in basement structures, basement walls you know, usually leak now. If you're going to place this a three-layered structure, uh, particularly the, the membrane portion affecting the wall, naturally, any water which is come in contact, likely to come in contact with the basement wall, naturally, that water will be carried, it will act as a filter, and then water enters this uh, central core, and then it will come down by gravity from where you can put a pipe and take it out, actually. So it actually ensures that there is no water which is going to get into the underground structure or a basement structure. So composites can be also drainage composites. They can be the simple concepts. They can be also reinforcement composites, we'll see later. So this is a reinforcement composite now. So what is it we have done in this case is we got a nano angiotestyle at the back now. The gray one is a nano angiotestyle. Okay, on this now, we place actually yarns or fibers. So these fibers could be glass fibers. They could be also polyester fibers now. And other side also, we got in this case, actually the same fibers now. They are knitted together. Knitting process is something like our socks. So they are knitted material. So that means you can call it the knitted geotestile actually. But in this case, the reinforcement composite because reinforcement is there by virtue of these uh, fibers. And then also it's a composite because of the presence of the nano geotestile. So it does both drainage and of course the reinforce function. So we can now see that such a variety of improvement in soil will be there by virtue of the material which is which is being chosen by virtue of the naturally properties which are emanating from the manufacture now. We can use similar products, we can develop similar products out of obviously a coconut fiber also. Quickly, we can see that's a topic uh, in the next lecture. So we can have a woven kind of a quad geotestile. We can also have a woven kind of jute geotestile. And then we can also have a, a non-woven kind of geotestile. You can see this. This is called actually a roll roll control blanket, which is used also in our own state, actually. We'll come and see when we have the next lecture, actually. That's in Chinada, in Vesudavari. These are used effectively to have erosion control mattress, basically. So these are actually what we can call as a non-woven coir blanket. Earlier, we had seen a woven coil blanket. And uh, both these are uh, the earlier blankets which we are talking. We can be used for other purposes. We'll see later. And uh, this, of course, essentially made for erosion control. We'll see that. It's called a biotechnical way of erosion control. So the, the functions which it does actually are mainly three, I mean, four plus on five, actually. What is it? It can separate. Suppose you've got a soft soil. On the soil, you put a, a geotestile. And then we can put uh, aggregate sub base course. Naturally, it will separate these two things. It will not allow mix. It will not allow the soft soil to get into this. Nor it will allow. Um, we can say 
the stones to come down into this and penetrate and lose them actually. And uh, they can be placed in layers actually to give us reinforcement. And as I mentioned now, they can be working like a drain along its own plane. It's called a planar permeability. And then this is called normal permeability. That means filter actually. And then we said already barrier. That means it will not allow water to get out. So these are the five major primary functions. Separation, reinforcement, drainage, filtration, and barrier or impurity. So these are the primary functions. Now along with this, it can also, suppose we got a membrane. Membrane is actually not so strong to withstand heavy loads basically. So we put a cushion over this now. So cushion will be a non angiotestyle. If you put non angiotestyle now, naturally damage onto membrane, which is essentially a barrier only, that can be giving a long life. And we can also contain the structure. That means we can contain a waste. We can also contain rocks and things like this now. So that's called a container. So in, naturally, they will give us a um, structure which will be equivalent to a heavy rock or something like that also. We'll see that also as we keep going. So the point we are trying to make is that uh, these geotestiles work wonderfully, basically. For example, we have very soft soil, maybe it's my kind of uh, um, sweary kind of soil now. We can place a geotestile over this now, any kind of geotestile, and then spread actually 15 centimeters of any kind of soil now. We can put a light bulldozer over this now. What is happening now? It enables construction. It gives you a temporary road. It gives access to that now. And then, of course, you can do that now. If you design this appropriately, we can also actually make, uh, you can say, 5 meter, 8 meter, 10 to 12 meter height embankment also, but that I've designed. But even without design also, like we use our uh, sandbags kind of thing, same thing can be done here also. We create access in emergency situations or in during construction. So that's what they found to So what is it is being done now? On the soft soil, we place a geotestile. And over that, you place 15 centimeters of sand, preferably, otherwise any other soil, over which you can put a dozer, and then we can keep moving further and making this temporary access to a major project. So that is the wonderful technology which is performed by this now. So when you come to the erosion part of it now, we know that we got 6,000 kilometers of uh, coast, sea coast. And of course, uh, through our own state, uh, basically, both the Krishna and um, Godavari meet the river. And uh, our neighborhood state, uh, Orissa, has got and down south, we've got Kaveri. All of them are subjected to many issues during um, floods and during tsunamis, things like this. Now, so what is it which is done usually is that we place what we call as pitching usually. It is called also revetment all over the world. Now we call pitching, but it's revetment now. So for this, uh, engineers, of course, know very well that a revetment or a pitching is actually a filter structure and is something which is raised down this now. So we, we have to have a filter structure that means consisting of various kinds of grains of soils, sandy soils kind of thing, gravelly soils. Over that, naturally, we are going to put heavy stones, which is called armor now. And we also usually put actually what you call launching apron. Okay, that's for toe protection. So these are the components normally we have in such revetment, that is going to be river bank protection, or of course, cost protection. This is a standard technology. So when you keep going to that now, so what is the function of this? We said the armor layer, the top layer actually, to protect against wave action or release of wave energy. The filter prevents sucking out of underlying soil and permits water flow through the structure, both ways, both inward and outward. That is very important for us to note. Then we have toe protection. And as I said, we can also have launching apron. And it protects actually seaward edge of the revetment, seaward or waterward edge of the revetment. Because if one stone is going to be coming out, out of the armor now, naturally, it will lead to movement of these other stones, and then finally, the last uh, during water flow in the river or uh, during tidal movement in the uh, coast also. So these are the three basic things which are required. Now, when once we do that, now we should also understand why this uh, pitching which are using, or equipment which are using, usually fails. Now, for example, we have these large stones placed, the armor stones which are placed now. Okay, if uh, the groundwater, let us say, in any given situation is flowing out into the water, flowing out into the moving water there. So what is happening now, along with the pressure which is exercised actually the groundwater flow, naturally also soil particles keep going out slowly, 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 slowly. And because of this now, what is going to happen now? These stones sink into the ground. And finally, they are dislodged downward actually. So you find that now, the soil particles are losing, or lost actually, and nothing to prevent in this now, because we didn't have proper filter here at the bottom now. So let us look at that now. So that is being provided here now. We have got some fine particles. We got some coarse particles. 
and over that we got uh, the larger stones actually and then we have what we call as a graded stone filter now so in this case now water can easily flow through the structure now the soil particles are able to move out now they are prevented basically and that's how these grains or these soil particles are not absolutely not moving out now so it will remain same and same thing happen when it the water is moving down also so that is the basic principle we are exercising now and the alternate solution for for us will be that we have all these layers actually salt to protect it and we got fine filter we got coarse filter we got primary armor we got secondary armor. that means number of soil particle sizes are going to be here and we know that the largest particle at the surface is based upon naturally the uh, the velocity of the water and many things now the wave action things like this now so what is important for us to understand is going to be <coughs> that we can now replace some of these layers actually by using the geotextile. What can kind of the geotextile now? Obviously, it will be one which is porous, which can act like filter and drain. That will be a non oven geotextile. So, depending upon what we want, actually, we can replace one or more of these filter layers actually by using say, geotextile filter, a non oven geotextile filter, or sometimes a composite also. <coughs> so, when we, when we look at that now, what about the top layer now? The top layer is armor layer. Normally, we have heavy, heavy stones now. Based upon the structure now, all our field engineers know that we need to give heavy, heavy blocks now. Some of these blocks could be as large than one meter cube, actually. Very difficult to handle now. The larger size, naturally, is also more expensive. So now they can be replaced. That means the larger uh, graded riprap and field stone, concrete rubble, all of them also can be alternated with concrete units, tripods, tetrapods, dolos, concrete blocks. That is standard way of doing it now we see whenever you go to sea coast actually we find some of these things now not always working effectively we can also have concrete mattress i will show you a concrete mattress we can also now have gabions or mattresses filled with stone we can also have bags of geo containers filled with sand so that is what we are going to focus upon now because these actually take care of the erosion fundamentally now what is that way we thought of now we thought that we can have a concrete facing kind of thing. That means it's not a solid facing, a concrete blocks, let us say, and beneath that geotextile field. That means we simply place a geotextile and then we place actually the concrete blocks on the top now. Or what we can do, we can also place actually, of course, direct rocks as we thought, if they're available and if they're durable. And then alternately now, we can think of a stone filled gabion. We'll look at what is a stone filled gabion actually. It is a mattress actually, which we'll see in the next picture and uh, we'll come to that so also we can have a hard armor erosion control but this is not hard like stones now what is it which is done now it's concrete cast in a geotextile former that means there is a double layer geotextile with the stitchings alternately and through which we can pump concrete actually in fact this has been done in uh, one of the, the major projects uh, actually in gujarat and uh, working very well basically in areas where the velocity of water is uh, very high and so much erosion of the toe and everything is happening now. They use this double layer mattress actually. And uh, we, in fact, we can have different varieties of this now. The Cerulee Paris Pona is working upon what are the module, what are the models which are available now. But quite a few of them are obviously patented. So in our country, we have the geotest available now. We need to only design what is the kind of form work we are going to edit now. What kind of mixtures of uh, sand, aggregate and cement and obviously how is it flowing or not now and many things are possible by using a, a double air mattress so when you talk of this kind of things now the first alternative we said to simple stone pitching or wetment will be use of mattress these mattresses are actually made of double pistred uh, hexagonal uh, mesh actually which could be obviously uh, coated with uh, it's a ga kind of wire or it can be also plastic coated actually or it can be both and then we can actually, the thickness could be of the order of 30 to 50 centimeters only. So we can have a number of uh, partitions for that now. And uh, we can, um, they are all being made in the country now. And of course, we can assemble them. Uh, I mean, we make them in the country, transport to the site and open up them now and fill with the stones. We'll see them, how it's done actually, and then seal it again. And this can be placed appropriately on the shores, on the banks. So if you want stability also, Naturally, the same boxes, which they call, we can call as gabion boxes. Naturally, we can be more thicker and number of them. This can be as thick as one meter usually. And uh, length could be anywhere from six to eight meters. That's a very common thing. 
remember that i use this word double twisted kind of thing is not handmade because handmade ones as tend to be quite loose they don't come in a standard size actually and you can't fill them properly to make a, a face appropriately face as well appropriately so these are all made of a special kind of gabion sheet actually and these are double twisted and we can have actually various kind of opening cells also um, by going so way depending upon the kind of stones which are there so let us see some examples of use of such kind of this one long long ago i think uh, probably 90s basically when the netlon netlon india started making uh, these nets actually which they call those days they are called grids only you find that they are coming in rows like this now and we can make the same kind of gabions using the plastic also they are basically uh, pp kind of material that is polypropylene kind of material and uh, naturally they first use in the ongc kandar project even now you can see that it's working perfectly so we have created these gabions right at the side filled with these stones locally available stones actually and you can see a perfect uh, surface being made and steps can be made like this now and the alternative they used to have in the early days uh, could be to make containers like this also so in this case uh, depending upon the kind of conditions you are going to have now uh, we can also ensure that the soil behind is not moving away so we actually line this gabions with the geotextile with the nano geotextile so this is what is done actually in the 90s actually gabions lined with the nano geotextile as was used in surat river production work filled with dredged sand in early 90s so you can see this now uh, we are not using any stones now and in order to see that the sand is not moving out because after all it's only giving a weight to you gives a flexible weight to you it's a flexible structure basically even if some cases some sediment is there we are not worried about that now but some of the this technology has not become popular despite its actual use in the early days and then these are now tubular gabions that means the, you know after all when the net is made it comes like a tube only during manufacture it comes like a tube now so we are cutting them and opening up into 1 meter width and 2 meter width now instead of cutting into pieces now we have the same tube now and hold it uh, next to the uh, in a barge next to the shore actually and then start filling the stones and then automatically it weighs down and then along the slope so we will see that a lot of examples of this now i have just picked up some of them uh, to show that this actually stabilizes the entire uh, bank or shore actually and what is it we are trying to look at also is that if you go to that brahmaputra again we see that uh, the river bank actually the river cross section is as much as sometimes 35 kilometers we don't know where it is going to go i mean sometimes the uh, flow is in the green way sometimes it moves this side so that is very difficult to control and we do not want to place any stones here now because you know uh, after all barges cannot move now after all through this uh, part of uh, madura island actually we have vessels barges of uh, filled with uh, petroleum crude actually are also moving now and we need a specific draft also and if the barge is hit by a stone at the bottom naturally we will lose all the oil all the crude so that is also an important kind of where and when and how we have to use it now so our aim is always to use the local soil available and construct structures we'll see it towards the end actually how it is done so in this case now this is done actually at sarda river we can see the how failure is occurring actually and what is it they have done they place its bags we'll see the bags actually is a less like sand bag only but structural design this is such a bag here now and they also place porcupines actually you can see already by the next year now already sedimentation started occurring and though in a covered portion and it's working very well now so many such cases are there in a uh, so these materials today after the initial success now can come in three different forms one of course just a shell bags so these bags are like this now like a wheat bag or any other paddy bag and then we have geotextile tubes which are which could be as much as 3 to 5 meter diameter and we could be uh, for workability about 20 meter long it can be any length anyway but 20 meter is quite common and then they could also be containers which i showed you right in the beginning of 1.5 by 2 meters and height as you think of now so what is going to happen is now what are these bags made of these bags are made of this like our cement bags only but then they got a opening size and they also can be combination of uh, both oven and nano geotextile we will see how they have been effectively used in uh, the same azure island later how these are made actually so use for this now we can take the sand from the uh, from the beach or shore or we can also see from the uh, 
uh, central islands if it is possible if they are allowed by the um, MOEF. So in these uh, things, the most common and successful systems are also in the tubular form, which we call a geotubes now. So and once you filled up this now, this is geotube basically. So what we said, it has got a diameter of around 5 meter and then length of about 20 meters. And then they are filled with the sand available in the, in the neighboring water body. So the features will be, the, it's a, in this case, a woven geotestile, diameter I mentioned, 3 to 5 meters. Length can be anything actually up to 40 meters. And fill material is going to be locally available sand and slurry. And where is a slurry? Because, you know, through the openings now, the water can get out actually very easily. So it also means that we may not necessarily place in a dry condition, we place in a wet condition only. It depends upon what we are going to do. So that is the flexibility which is going to be there. So in a technical structure now, to protect the shore or um, shore, basically, we place a tube. They can be bags to see that it is in position right, in the place, uh, right at the placement time. And also they are covered with mattress for many reasons, actually. So that means the structure now we'll also see later. We may also place, particularly if you are placing underwater using a barge you now, we need actually base also to see that this doesn't sink. Because after all, it's a dead weight only. Huge weight is going to be there, which will take care of all the forces. So they can be used in the form of spur or a strut or a dike, whatever you call it now. They can place along the shore. They can place across also. It is actually a question of the design, which is, can be possible now. So what is it trying to do, actually? Uh, one is cover apron in order to see that the uh, bottom is not scoured, actually, at least initially. And uh, so we have the water forces causing erosion to be controlled. We can also have ovation waves, which will be, it should withstand, obviously. And then for that now, we place actually a scour apron, which is uh, kept in place by using sandbags or geobags, actually. And as I said, we need a cover such that this is not spoiled, actually. So we need a cover using uh, gabions or using uh, sandbags or uh, geobags. And uh, in course of time, even the, of course, this side, this side, finally, after placement now, we better fill it with uh, naturally sand or water locals are available now. And slowly, slowly, on this side also, on the water side also, there's a buildup of sand actually. So there is more uh, accretion which is happening. And that is a kind of permanent feature. So we can also do this. Basically. That means we can have these bags. And in this case, it is sunk then by using uh, ropes only. And filling up is happening. Hydraulic filling is happening with this. And uh, so after filling up now, they can be towed actually up to the given place. And sometimes we have bottom opening kind of barges now. So they can be laid, I mean, first they can be towed in position and towed to the site. And then, of course, from there, it's going to be uh, bottom opened actually. And naturally, it will fall down. Or it can be thrown out of a barge also. So there are many ways. In fact, in India, it is being done so commonly now. One thing is we are not aware commonly because this is not a textbook material. The other thing we are also saying, we just mentioned also that earlier we said we got the plastic gabions, that means HDPE or PP bags, PP uh, gabion material, which is actually geonet only. And now we can also make much stronger material using ropes, using polymer ropes. The same for fishing, we use you know those ropes actually. The same ropes actually can hold one meter cube of rock also. So that means whether you can make these gabions today. Not only with the GA wire gabion kind of thing, you can also make with the polymer rope gabion. So these, of course, have been used, all of them now. Initially, of course, people, uh, um, particularly in Kerala, you know, we have this coir available now. So they had to use the coir bags, basically, coir, coir bag, which is lined with rubber at the base now, filled with sand, and they use it for a groin, actually. This is, of course, a fishing harbor, uh, which is called Vinjin Jam, uh, near um, Tiruvanthapuram. So it's successful, actually. And uh, luckily, uh, the coir is not affected by the water, actually. That is the luckiest part of it now. And you can see water and waste being collected. So this is the natural production, which is going to come and coming out of this. And it is preventing literal drift also. It is giving you the area, uh, naturally, for fishing boats very easily. And we see, actually, the tidal action, which is happening. We can also see that, actually, that the damage which you are going to see in places like Upada is terrible. We have all these huge stones. You can see the kind of damage is there.
Then we can see again similar kind of situation now. This is you can say village like Gopal are there now, and you can see the road completely failing now. I can see such huge stones, cubical stones, and other parts, and all of them are being placed, but no effect now. Naturally, in one tsunami time or uh, cyclone time, actually there is a damage to this. So one of the ways in which people have done for tsunami in Tamil Nadu actually is basically just filling a I man filling the shore with the bags completely. Okay, and you can see they are able to take care of the waves also. And uh, similar example we have in Samnad Mandir in Tithal actually in uh, in the coast of Gujarat actually. And we find that uh, this Tavanar Bandar is very old temple actually. And we see that there is a lot of damage occurring to this now. And so much is happening that uh, the temple authorities are worried about this now. So what they have done actually is they tried to protect this entire thing. This is original beach profile. And they made a new profile using polymer rogue avians actually. Uh, number of them now. And uh, first they rebuilt the entire thing now and filled with some stones and then covered the whole thing using the same kind of. Uh, a rope filled, uh, I mean, uh, stone filled rope gabions actually, and uh, excellent sada. So today people do picnic also, and uh, you can see the temple quite nearby, within half a kilometer. It's not so nearby, it's within half a kilometer. But they were worried that the entire thing will be eroded, uh, coast will be eroded by this. So this is the first successful use of uh, the rope gabions in such a situation, and many such solutions are available actually. Many such solutions are available to us. Throughout the world, I am not getting into those details. I am not getting into those details. And then we talk of these gabions. Excuse me. So it's not necessarily only one gabion. It can be multiple gabions actually. So these uh, design philosophy is available actually internationally and uh, in relevant books also. There are standards which are available for this subject now. And uh, for, uh, so wherein they place these gabions and then you can see the kind of cushion they place using the uh, stone filled uh, gabions actually. I mean, uh, rogue gabions with, uh, filled with stones now. This is part of village now. And uh, one can go and see how successful it is actually. And uh, that is the cover which we are seeing now. And then actually this is a sea. And uh, you can see houses quite nearby. And prevented damage, further damage to the entire area. Now this has been done over probably some 10 kilometers or so. Initially they did very limited uh, kind of thing. They did for quite a length of time, quite a length now. And uh, actually, the Andhra Pradesh Space Application Center, APSAC actually, have like, taken up a survey. They published a paper, actually, one of the events uh, held at uh, Bhavanesar about, uh, I think, two, three years back, actually. So they said shoreline evaluation along Uppada coast in Andhra Pradesh using multi temporal satellite images and model based approach. So, what they have done actually is very interesting. So, we have this beach here, we have this uh, production area. And then they have actually surveyed the what is the movement of uh, the coast actually, that is the beaches, uh, movement of port and world actually. And uh, they talked of uh, what is happening to this area which is protected by the geotubes. So, in the present study, shoreline change is investigated based on the satellite images of uh, right from 89 to 2018 along the Upada coast. During the 89 to 2010, the average accretion rate is plus 1.4 meters per year and erosion rate is minus 2.22 meters. So the rate of accretion and erosion is observed to be deviating between uh, naturally plus 7.9 meter per year to minus 8.01 per meter per year. The erosion activities are moderately high compared to accretion in study or during the period 2012 to 2018. However, erosion activities are not occurred in the middle region of the Upada coast. So that is actually we are talking of that only. So they are given a details uh, present that. So this can be naturally further studied by them also. But essentially, the paper gives you a lot of details. The erosion activities are not occurring in the middle region of the Upada coast. That is the main thing. This is a paper which I can share with you. They are presented in uh, 
uh, in a conference held in Bhuvaneswar, in a seminar held in Bhuvaneswar. And uh, you can also contact the organization to find more details of this one. is one of the most successful studies, uh, studies of uh, such a kind of uh, work is done. And you can see uh, wherever uh, naturally we have got the sea coast now, there's so much damage to structures and things like that now, beaches are affected, we have so much loss of this now. And uh, naturally, they protected the further damage to the beach by using a Jiu um, tube. But obviously, I do not want to say this is the most successful structure. Why? Because it doesn't have a cover now. And once you don't have a cover over this, obviously, this can be damaged by anybody. And then, naturally, the sand will come out and it will be lost now. So it needs a cover, actually, to take care of other forces and also take care of the vandalism also, which can happen now. So the application areas can be very vast. It can be flood production dikes, containment dikes, square dikes, underwater dikes, dike beach repair, artificial reefs, and uh, also coastal groins, offshore breakwaters, beach nourishment, shoreline structures, onshore and offshore stability bombs, coastal and sand dune protection. And uh, based upon AOS, the design is very simple. Based upon the apparent opening size, the size, you know, like a soil particle sizes, we also got opening size in geotextile of the geotextile and the sand. We have to choose that appropriately. And also, depending upon the load, which is going to have self generated load, naturally, the strength of the geotextile has to be chosen now. And the size of the unit, overall size of the unit now, the handling stresses, the ultimate stability, all of them have to take into account. And uh, as I said, we can have a number of the smaller ones also. And then cover it with naturally uh, bags or gabions, whatever you think of, all around basically, so that it becomes a structure now. And uh, we can have a filling at uh, the same place now. We have a, naturally is being dumped into this, and uh, naturally the bag in this case be filled up. So the various technologies are developed for doing this now. In this case, a large bag which can't be handled by us. Earlier, I've shown you bags which can be filled with by hand only <coughs> with the labor now. And here everything is machine fielding and they can be handled by machines only, cranes, and then placed appropriately. And uh, also somebody has studied this now. So they simply put all these bags actually on a soft soil on which you're going to walk through and then put a JCB over this now. And now a crane over this now. So you can really see actually it can take all these loads because this becomes a load transfer platform. This is like a payment indirectly, highly flexible now actually. So that is the kind of uh, capability these materials have got now. And uh, you can see filling these bags with uh, sandy kind of soil, uh, local soil, is itself giving you a platform for us to work, actually. That is the beauty of this entire philosophy of this uh, geo bags, actually. And um, as I said, uh, what I've shown earlier was a Vinyan Jam in Kerala using the coil bags and locally made. And there are specifications that are available now to make uh, uh, for specifying the geo tubes and how to make it now, the joints and things like that now, what are the weakest points which are there, and also the score apparent. I'm not giving details of this. Uh, as <clears throat> and uh, we can fill up with, uh, as I said, uh, dry sand also. We can fill up with uh, dredger portion also. And uh, I can see the, the space between the our round structure and the local area has to be also filled up with sand, but initially it's used for construction. And uh, again, it's a hydraulic filling in this case now. Uh, you can see this actually through one opening. We are going to fill up now. We have a number of uh, mouths here actually. One mouth is kept open for that excess water is going to drain out also if it is there now. And we have to fix up a density for doing this now. And we have to also see what kind of uh, sand size particles are coming in order to ensure that uh, they don't move away, move also from inside to outside actually. And uh, they are not war filled also. So there are criteria which are available in the literature which gives you this now. So then we move to <coughs> Uh, what we call as a Penta Beach. Penta Beach is uh, something like 150 kilometers uh, northward from Bonesar, actually. This is the structure which we are talking of, basically. And uh, But for this structure, basically, in the tsunami period, 37,000 hectares of paddy land could have been damaged, actually. That is the kind of uh, safety net which is being provided by these kind of things. <coughs> so the structure itself, uh, in fact, earlier they tried many things. They use also uh, normal pitching, they also use uh, handmade gabions and things like that. Now, when you, when you go to the site, we got all the pictures how failure of different kinds was made, made and uh, uh, there is a danger to this uh, paddy fields actually. So, finally, the design approved by local uh, government as well as uh, World Bank getting funded 
and so we have actually number of jew troops placed on other one now and then we have these gabions which are being placed actually to protect this now and later also they have to have basically a pile because you know they even during construction actually there's so much damage to this coast actually that they need a pile to to protect the toe of the structure and so they put some pipes and also a kind of sheet pile and also put gabions in front so that it becomes a total solar structure so mind you these are not textbook solutions. These are solutions based upon the site conditions using fundamentals of oceanography, using fundamentals of geotextiles, using fundamentals of geo um, tubes, and fundamentals of the cover portion gabions, actually. In this case, they are all rope gabions. So you find that this technology is, uh, again, I repeat, repeatedly keep saying it, it's not textbook material, but then this can be done by any one of you. Some of you have done AMTEC also. You wouldn't have learned all the details of human genetics also, but then one can read it. A lot of data is available freely through net also. And of course, I brought out many books also. There are a lot of conference in India. There is one international Jewish society uh, in a place in Delhi. And uh, naturally, a lot of literature will you can freely download literature available from that also. And from the net, several companies keep giving you, but they will not give you local information. We have a lot of local information which I've shown you. So let us see some pictures of this also. So during construction, how they are doing it now, how they are pumping uh, this now. So in this case, again, uh, in the case of our Popada, naturally, we could fill up the local sand only. But in this case, when the work was about to start, the objection of the environmental quarters now, they said you can't fill the sand because uh, you know it, it is a host to certain kind of fish only. So the fishermen got into issue. And then they have to actually import the sand from under 100 kilometers. Obviously, when once you import the sand from somewhere else, it is going to be not going to be an expensive proposition. But then, anyway, they went ahead and started doing it now. So, initially, the first layer of uh, the tubes is done, and then second layer is coming up slowly, slowly. And it's not uh, something which is really there. And then, naturally, um, we are building up the cover of this now. Again, it looks like a silo only because uh, from this, naturally, they are pumping uh, the, along with water into the different. Uh, the geo tubes actually. So uh, it happened. We it happened that uh, we went there. I will show you some pictures of that also. So what is happening with geo systems in general? There is no permanent structure. Permanent structure means there is no concrete structure. There is no huge uh, dolos or huge concrete or stones now, which have not been working perfectly now. So we are reducing one. We are actually instead of repairing every year now, we got a permanent flexible solution, and it also gives us less uh, time also for execution. Direction execution time and overall direction reconstruction cost and also natural maintenance cost. The use of local materials, low skilled labor, and locally owned equipment. You know, we didn't import any equipment for these things now. The processing is very simple. And uh, the elements can be tailor made. Tailor made means uh, depending kind of sand, we can choose the geotestile. And uh, depending upon how handled, we can choose the size of the uh, geotube also, length and diameter, we can choose it now because ultimately we are filling it with the sand only. So they got a weight now. So this weight is one which is assisting the forces now. So then we are using the local technology to make these bags also. That means geo bags. We are using the local Indian ropes only to make the gabions actually. We are using smaller stones instead of putting big pitching stones which didn't work. So you see these uh, many kinds of things are there. So these have worked actually in coastal areas and waterways by tsunami, hurricane and flood waves uh, in India and abroad. Geosics are, we have seen, are thin, flexible sheet like materials most suitable for earth retention erosion control and coastal channel production and of course they are reliable and easy to install and geos rigs are lightweight with minimum maintenance and uh, naturally the handling is very easy because you're not uh, you're only just bringing the cloth you're only bringing the cloth in roll form to the side and at the side you're making it uh, weighty and so handling is going to be in way in one way easy of course you have to fill it up now so these are the finished uh, structure which you see in Penta Beach. And you can see the cover actually, and how we filled up with the back now. And uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Venkatraman, formerly uh, advisor, formerly uh, vice president of uh, Galway of Alrose, in his time only the proposal made. And uh, as I said, in the time of the event at Vovanesar, we went to see that now. So this is actual structure which is there. Under view, I can show you also. This is the, you know, in between sand was filled now, this is the, bank actually you can say coast this or not and uh, in fact you know if you just see from here there is another kind of small island small island you can just see the when the uh, what do you call sky is clear now 
So what they were trying to this is that place is about 1.5 kilometer. They say that now, some 50 years back, probably just before independence, the coast actually was there, it seems. So you can see how much attrition has taken place over the years, actually. So like this, now we are losing a lot of land. Of course, we know the last uh, and here the Madras port also, a lot of work is being done now also, uh, to the roads also. To the so in all these roads, actually, which are particularly protection also, as well as uh, obviously for tourism and easy, uh, easy conveyance, actually. So these structures become relevant to most of our needs. That is the beauty of this now. So the kind of solution, I'll come back to this. I'll just show you something later and come. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Once again. Yeah, you can see this. This is a Madura island actually. So I have given the solutions, different kind of solutions. You know how to anchor them and how to place geotextile and how to place the bags. I have given at different times uh, different solutions now, and that is what was executed actually by the local people. So you can see all these uh, different kind of solutions which are given. I implemented now, and in fact the local people have fought because you know I was consulting for the board. I gave a solution uh, which was about uh, more than ten years back now. But they were not implementing. I have no news at all. Finally, about two years back, they had a, a national event uh, on erosion control of the Brahmaputra River. And the local people actually insisted that the solution was given by so and so. Why don't you adopt it now? So they adopted that. And uh, the most successful works has been demonstrated here now. And this is actually the court page of their uh, diary they have given now. I met the people who uh, did hesitation to see that the solution implemented now. So these actually become foolproof solutions. So that is something which is going to be. Very important, which one has to see them. So, different kind of solutions are given depending upon the severity of uh, this, you know. And uh, yeah, so different kind of solutions have been given at different points actually all along the Majula Island, uh, which is a, a sacred place for the all uh, people in uh, uh, Gauhati. <coughs> so, what I have tried to give you actually is a solution, a brand of solutions which are. Which have proved themselves very well, and then which can adopt it very easily. And the material is locally made. We can get them tested as per standards available right in the country. And then also, the handling is essentially the material. Other kinds of material is going to be only locally available soil. Okay, and that's why we are able to save the conference that both in rivers as well as sea coasts. Actually, it is possible to use such solutions which are flexible and durable solutions. And also, we can say that uh, we use less machines. I mean, we don't use such heavy machinery like in concrete and all. We can use any kind of machinery depending upon the local situation, access and things. So this part of the presentation is over now. Anybody has got any questions on this? You want to ask now, or should I go for the next presentation? Chakrapani Garu, should we have some questions now? Hello? No questions, sir. Okay, then. Okay, okay sir, move on to next. Yeah. Everything in the questions are good, Randy. Are good, sir. Unmute and can type chess and may unmute chess. So, anyone? Let's next to the start is the start. Okay. So the next topic I have chosen for presentation is uh, 
under the family of geosynthetics. We also have geotextiles made of natural fibers. Okay, am I audible? Hello? Yes, sir. Audible, sir. Okay. So, these are made with natural fibers. We will see what they are and what is the best way you can use it now. Of course, the very first one I have shown you, these are known as the coir geotextiles. And uh, the Bureau of Indian Standards has uh, agreed to use the word coir bhuvastra. Bhuvastra, obviously, for geotextiles, the Sanskrit word, Sanskrit word for geotextiles, bhuvastra. So it is uh, internationally known as you know, bhuvastra to distinguish, between, to distinguish between Indian coir geotextiles and other geotextiles, actually, from other parts of the world. So we have been working on this, I think, almost now 30 years on this topic. And uh, I think I don't have to explain uh, what is this now. This is represents typically a coconut form you can see in any one of your areas. <clears throat> and uh, from the coconut husk now, we can obtain the fiber. In all our districts, particularly East and West Kerala district now, when you go to the areas which are obviously plenty in coconut trees actually, we find the husk being taken out. And uh, we got simple machines called de husking machine. You just put the husk in that machine and obviously just fiber comes out of that now. And leaving alone, the uh, leaving uh, separately, the what we call a coir pith. So coir pith is very good for uh, agricultural kind of use now, which is very commonly used today. In fact, our own roof garden and uh, garden in our own uh, nursery yard, actually, we also use coir pith effectively. So we have the coir fiber from where we can use, obviously, uh, get coir ropes, or we can also make uh, using the fiber a non-oven kind of geotestile. So if you look at the coirs, actually, coir fibers, the length could be varying based upon the kind of uh, origin of the plant. So 50 to 150 millimeters could be the length and diameter could be anywhere from 0.2 to 0 0.6 millimeters. And uh, we have, of course, high production of this coir fiber, uh, particularly in a state like Kerala, naturally social refractivity. A lot of women actually make it doing this. We'll talk more on this later. Uh, but high production is there. Uh, today, of course, the uh, production has moved from essentially, which was a product of Kerala, has moved to Tamil Nadu and also a place called Palachi and also a lot of areas in Karnataka and of course Andhra Pradesh now we start producing the coir fiber. And then from this, as I said, we can use the material, the woven coir geotestiles as well as non-woven coir geotestiles, primarily for erosion control. But then today we also start, did a lot of work on how to use this material but the woven coir geotextiles in rural roads also. We'll see some experience in that also. And then we also studied actually what is the degradation which we think of doing it. Because, you know, normally when once in, in our country we started using this coir material, it is actually goes to uh, centuries old. It is a centuries old material in form of coir rows. Uh, when I was a child actually uh, living in the Narsapur, Palakol and all, we only used, of course, uh, well water. And, you know, being near the river, obviously, I can have a well, actually. And from there, I have only a small bucket and the coir rope. And coir rope never got broken. What really used to happen is, after some time now, the fibers used to get untangled, actually. Because, you know, the roughness is gone. Basically, that means pit part is gone now. It's untangled and uh, uh, untwisted, actually. Became straight, and then they started losing the strength. So the twisting was earlier possible. But then it became like this. So it never got uh, really... Uh, degraded basically. So I find that uh, when once they are not degradable basically in such a way as people imagine and such a way as the city people uh, want us to imagine, they have a life definitely. So we have done a lot of studies at IIT Delhi on what is life uh, of these materials in various conditions. There's not time to go into that now. They have a specific life which I can show you in this now. Long ago, this may be 35 to 40 years back, the Bundestag means it's a Agency of uh, standardization in Germany. <clears throat> what they they also studied this. In fact, uh, one of the popular countries which uses coir geotextiles is actually for erosion control is Germany. A lot of import export used to happen to India to that, and they also start making themselves at their machines. In fact, some of our machines which we use could be also from uh, uh, Germany. Whereas cotton degrades totally in six weeks. And due to eight weeks, coir has retained 2% strength even after one year. It takes 15 times longer than cotton 
and seven times longer than jute degrade. That means coir takes actually 15 times longer than cotton and seven times longer than jute to degrade. We don't know what are the conditions they have tested basically, but then the point they are trying to make is now it definitely lasts much longer than cotton and of course jute. Now today we know that the growth of microorganisms which degrade this material depends on their chemical composition. The longer resistance of core is due to its high lignin content, about 35%, compared to about 12% for jute. This is something we have to remember now. The lignin content, lignin which is covering the coir fiber or of course jute fiber also is very high, highest in coir and that is what binds them, that is what resists the degradation actually. So you find that uh, you know there are all these fibers are essentially cellulose or hemicellulose. That means in a way, when we talk on polyester or other things, you know, they are polymers. Okay, but basically they are cellulose basically. Here also we have the same cellulose which is going to be there. Same so cellulose or hemicellulose now, and they are all actually like tubes now, and the binding material around them is of course the coir pith now. So initially the husk may look like this, and more uh, you can say enlargement is a merrier now. Enlarger more times, and we find this now. So, you can see is a bundle of these tubes which are handling basically, and we are trying to break the surfaces by using other means now. So, from these kind of yarns now, we are twisting by handmade machines, hand machines actually called rod. They are called rod actually. So, from the rod, we get a, a yarn, third and top. So, from that, we can use a kind of uh, machinery. You can say a rural machinery or the garden industry. The CCRI at uh, Alapi, Alapusa, we call now, has developed a lot of machines which can be used actually by local uh, uh, villagers itself and then make these uh, geotextiles. So they are meant for uh, other uses now. So this is where HVM9 could be weighing as much as 900 GSM. So this is very important for us to remember. Whereas most of the geosynthetics which are using, or of the order of around 250, 200, 250 GSM. GSM is the weight actually is grams per square meter. And uh, when once you want to use a kind of heavier one, it could be uh, in this case up to 900 GSM. So one fundamental difference is going to be that they are much, much heavier than the so-called synthetic polymeric material. And uh, so per unit area there. So at IIT, as I said, we did a lot of work on trying to find out the engine properties because they are not available now and degradation characteristics. And in fact, there's a book which I published on the subject of Coir Bovastra in civil engineering now. In, in all its facets, we try to deal with the subject as an engineering material. So when you try to do that now, what is it we find is that now, the mass per unit area, as I said now, can be sometimes up to 13, 35. 13, that means it can weigh per square meter 1.3 kilograms. It's very heavy, obviously. And the tensile strength now is very low, 3.86, 6.34, 10.63, 30. Meter. You know, whenever we talk of uh, strength of a geostatic, uh, you know, we're talking hundreds of kilonewtons, we're talking of thousand kilonewtons also, this material is not as strong as that now. The second thing, of course, we are finding is that we find that the elongation failure is also very heavy, 20, 19.17, 31.69, 42%, depending upon the material now. That means to develop the strength of this much, we require 20% strain. To develop the strength of uh, 31.5, we require 42% elongation. That means we can't use for reinforcing any structure. We can't use it in a reinforced all structure like RE walls we call in the city. And uh, also the strength could be different in the road direction, which is called machine direction, and uh, cross machine direction, that means across the road actually called web direction. But that could be also very much different. 3.86, 2.5, 6.34, 4.3. That means it's not going to be isotropic. The strength in both directions could be different also. And also we find that the roll width is usually very small, actually. It could be just one, one meter, usually more one meter only. And whereas today, uh, I think uh, no geosynthetic is uh, weighing, is uh, uh, having uh, less than five meter width, actually. Okay, so that is the way we have to compare these materials if you want to compare from the engineering properties viewpoint. So then we come to this non-oven kind of cardio This process is slightly more, uh, I don't say cumbersome, but we require a, a, a costly machinery. The machinery may cost about two crores actually. Earlier, the machinery cost was anywhere from 50,000 rupees to few lakhs only, right from processing to this now. So by this process now, we have actually three layered material. One is a coir fiber, 
and there is a screen on the top and bottom. So when you start making a cloth actually out of this now, and we're only laying it, we're not punching together, we're not binding them together. So to keep in position now, we are putting a screen of a very lightweight material, you know, like uh, you go to Alliance, you know, you get your vegetables in a pack actually, it's like a net now. So it's called a BOP net kind of thing. So this weight of this is going to be very, very small. It hardly weighs actually four to six grams per meter square. Whereas this will be hundreds of square meter, hundreds of uh, grams actually. Okay. So one at the bottom, one at the top now. And then this is stitched actually by multiple stitching actually. You can see the stitching. This is across and this is along, of course, both ways are there now. And uh, we can also replace this with respect to using a jute fabric at the bottom now. And we can also replace it with a stitching kind of thing, not with necessarily a, a synthetic rope uh, like we use in uh, cement bags. But then we can also do this using actually jute yarn. So the point we're trying to make is if you are having uh, stitching also with uh, jute, material itself is uh, coil. And that means we are making 100% degradable material. And whereas here, it could be 98, 99% degradable material. So that is the difference between these things now. And uh, all these things can be made now. So in the initial studies we have made now, in fact, this particular study has uh, got an award also, uh, long back. So we also studied actually the non on What is the strength of this material now? You can first see that mass of interior is, uh, again, starting from 4 feet 20, 865, 1175 grams per meter square. And then, of course, the density strength is also going to be this much now. In some cases, so small. Where from the strength is going to come? It's not coming from the fiber. It's coming only from the stitching, the number of ropes, uh, number of yarns which are going to bind it together now. So you find that uh, both in the machine direction and in the plasma direction, the strength is very, very low. Elongation, again, as you see, it can go up to even 27.5, otherwise 9.7 and all, actually. So both in terms of elongation and in terms of uh, strength now, these materials are much weaker than the woven geotextile, woven core geotextiles. And of course, compared to synthetic product, they're of course uh, a commodity by itself. They're very much different. So some studies initially we have done actually, we kept this in a different kind of media. Different kind of media, that means right from uh, cow dung to uh, manure material to uh, soaking in sand and uh, wetting and drying and uh, at different conditions now. So once, what we have done is, for example, we want to use it in a road structure. It is going to be on a soft clay. So we said, okay, let us soak it in the soft clay and uh, keep, it, keep it always soaked only, not wetting and drying. So we find that uh, the one kind of core material has got life. I mean, you can see the percentage of reduction strength. So the reduction strength at the end of, let's say, 12 months is only 30%. And uh, this material we have said only up to five months or six months. And here also the reduction is only 22%, 25%, uh, something like that. So the, they don't lose the strength so quickly. When you go to the jute, we'll see how quickly they lose strength also. So the point is that now they are available differently for longer durations than normally expected. And if the performance can be guaranteed, if the function of that, we'll see that the function of this can be done during this one year before it uh, degrades naturally why why not we use it so using this concept of using its best characteristics we studied a, a number of things uh, erosion control rural roads edge drains silt fans ground improvement reinforcement we are not going to call them now but why i'm taking pains to go through this entire subject is going to be today these are materials which are of course wherein the test methods have been developed and published by the pure standards and then also some of the products are actually specified in the Bureau of Indian Standards. And then it's used now, both erosion control and rural roads has been approved by the Indian Roads Congress. So you see this now from 30 years back now, when we start understanding the materials and where no studies on degradability, no studies on strength and dimension, other properties now, we have developed a methodology which is accepted by the Bureau of Indian Standards. We also had a lot of field trials actually, trying to see what how exactly they behave in the field now through long-term studies. Some of the studies in Kerala, uh, which we got done through the College of Engineering Trivandrum, um, financed by the Coir Board of India. Naturally, these studies went on up to seven years, eight years. Similarly, studies have been done by the National Institute of Technology, uh, of course, and roads and uh, near uh, Trichy. They have also done a lot of work for years together. They did a lot of work on 
for these uh, use of these materials in rural roads now. And in fact, these studies have allowed IRC, I think uh, probably the document will come out very, very shortly because the intentional approval was done, was, uh, was done by recently one of the committees. One more committee has to go through. So fully by about uh, on the three months now, or maybe when the council meeting uh, will be held in uh, presumably in February, it will be published also. So you see that now, what I'm talking is some history part of it, some studies we have done to make it amenable for use in the uh, structures. But then today it becomes a standard product now. But we have to use it with care because the function of this has done during its life period. Because the life of this material is definitely much less compared to that of a synthetic one. In synthetic one, we can add some chemicals to improve the life. We can add some chemicals to improve the alter stability. We can add some other kind of things to improve the other characteristics. Change characteristics, not necessarily improve. But in this case, it's difficult to add anything at all. But then we made some gimmicks, I should say, with jute now. I'll explain those things with jute. And uh, so we tried all of them now. So we are going to focus today on essentially two things, maybe three things, erosion control, rural roads, and ground improvement. Now, one thing we should imagine is that when the first drop of rain comes on the ground, the drop has got a weight. Isn't it? It is coming uh, maybe from a few kilometers up from the sky and is falling down on the ground like almost like a mini bomb. So when the surface of the soil is dry, what's going to happen now? This impact, I don't know, so many kilojoules is going to be impacting on the ground now. So naturally it is going to loosen the particles. It makes a small crater. Next time the rain comes after a summer, you can see these small, small uh, uh, craters and then particles being loosened. So, when once initially the particles are loosened like this now by these raindrops, naturally, slowly, slowly, as the monsoon increases now, these loosened soil particles will keep moving through along with the water, along uh, natural gradient things like that now with the different velocities. And slowly, slowly, it forms what we call as rills. Okay, so it is these rills actually which are going to be responsible for naturally more and more irrigation. Right? So, we know actually. Uh, I can give you one important statistic actually. From the mouths of both Ganga and Brahmaputra, which is around uh, Bangladesh and uh, Calcutta, in, the, in those areas generally, you know how much my sediment goes, keeps going into this? The sediment which is getting into the Bay of Bengal through these mouths itself is actually taken to be as, I think, something like 400 million tons per annum. 400 million tons per annum. That is the kind of sediment which comes in into the sea bay of Bengal through these river mouths. Now, obviously, it doesn't have is water also. The sediment means it is water also. Maybe assume that even 10% or 20% of uh, soil now, you can imagine now it is 400 million tons. So, assume 1%, it means a 1 million ton. So, it is anywhere from 1 million ton to some 30, 40 million tons every year. Sediment is flowing through that. So, the sediment keeps moving actually slowly, slowly, up to what we call as Krishna and Godavari uh, for mouths also. So what is happening is, you know, this sediment is unconsolidated sediment also. In fact, initially, when we started work on uh, working on offshore soils in the bottom and all, what we found is that these sediments actually are not consolidated. And below that, as you know, now, we got a lot of gas reserves, actually. The, the, the petroleum crude is all in terms of gas, actually. So we are using uh, these gases very well for cooking and uh, industrial use also. So what really is happening is the, the initial investigations long back, that is in the, in the 80s particularly, when these Jacob bricks used to come and start boring through the soil to find out what is the amount of petroleum crude available or whatever form it is, they used to kind of some kind of, you know, just open the kind of bomb kind of thing. So it used to bomb actually. So they were worried about this one. So when you bring a sample, sealed sample to the laboratory, the moment you open the seal, it used to burst out actually. So it was gaseous in the bottom. And then started the top actually. And the only thing uh, which we find similar kind of statistics is going to be 350 million tons from Gulf of Mexico. And if you really put the sediment coming from mouths of uh, obviously Krishna, Godavari, Kaveri, and this side, Narada Tapati, and things like that now, so you find that millions and millions of tons of soil are being eroded now. So you don't have to measure the surface loss. We have got all the loss here actually. So we can see if you want to control the erosion, you have to control at the source itself. That is the point. These rills have to be controlled. So, best way to control this is going to be also using natural fibers. That is what we are going to come across. So, 
What do we say? It is surface soil erosion, dislodgement of soil particles, and their transportation downslope as a series of events. Erosion control obviously means restraining the initial movement of soil particles by wind and water. Initially, not only we are talking about water, but even wind loss is going to be very heavy. Those of you who studied in Pilani or in Rajasthan naturally know very well how much loss is there due to wind actually, because the kind of uh, sand which is going to be moving in the air, you know, something you can't see in every building also. You are you'll be blinded by the sand dust actually. There are sandstorms. When I was student in Pilani long back uh, in the early 60s, naturally I couldn't see the mass building from a hostel building, the just nest door only. So that is a kind of loss due to wind also. So an effective erosion control material will reduce the impact of raindrops on the soil and impede over land water flow. What is it we're trying to say now? Uh, let it use a barren ground. The water particles, water uh, molecules or whatever it is, uh, the water bubbles is simply getting dropped on the soil, on the bare soil. Now we put something, now we put a rope kind of thing, a kind of uh, hexagonal square structure now. Some of these part, uh, some of these raindrops are going to fall on the rope itself. And uh, some of them may fall in the aperture, but then the aperture is covered on all the four sides by the, uh, obviously, the coil ropes and things like that now. So, first of all, it's going to reduce impact. That means it's going to minimize the raindrops. And further, actually, as with the water is trying to move around the slope now, these uh, ropes, basically, be uh, jutter coil now, are going to impede the water flow. And that means it's going to reduce velocity. If it's a barren land now, you know very well, you know, the kind of velocities which are going to, you can calculate the velocity also, along with, that's where the, the rill is formed. Isn't it? Now, when once you got these check posts, actually, continuously, the velocity will be more or less the same as it started with the top of the slope. So that is something very interesting for us. So we find that fewer soil particles will become dislodged during rainfall. And also we are slowing the rainfall, we are slowing the movement of water. And obviously that means some water is going to get into the slope also. That's good actually. So what is going to happen now? Reduction in the transport capacity of the thin sheet flow, thereby minimizing the displacement of dislodged particles. Infiltration of more rainfall into the soil, providing desirable moisture to newly planted seedlings. That is important. Next step is going to be more important, actually. So, what is it we are trying to say now is that we are by trying to use these uh, natural fiber jutter cells, be it jutter coir now, we are attacking the fundamentals of the system. That means we are trying to first of all see that the lapa, the raindrops are not coming directly on the ground. Some of them may still fall on the ground, but they are going to fall on the uh, net also, which are creating. And once it is falling on the net now, more water, that means the loosening, loosening is reduced. And the transport is also reduced because the velocity is being uh, not increasing in the same rate as in a barren soil. So that is, and when once it is taking less velocity, it is able to put more water into the ground, which is now going to help the vegetation to grow on that. That's why it's called biotechnical stabilization. So these <clears throat> products, which we now call as uh, road erosion control products now, they are expected to serve mitigation of erosion both in short term and long term. Uh, this is the American version of it now, actually. In long term, they mean actually non degradable kind of material. That means synthetic material, actually. So we are talking of the short term kind of thing through the establishment and maintenance of the cover now. So, what is it going to do? We are actually going to grow turfing on the slope such that <coughs> advantage is going to be there. We'll see that also. So these solutions, as I mentioned to you, are called biotechnical engineering solutions. So before these RECPs, that is, road erosion control products, have come, mulching was done. That means, you know, you throw a dry grass something other now. So that decays, and that becomes a manure. And through that, the vegetation can grow. And the vegetation is going to minimize the flow of water, because, you know, these blades of grass are actually not allowing free flow of water now. And water, we said, is occurring by virtue of uh, provision of a net now is happening by virtue of the vegetation. So the vegetation is going to be growing and what is happening is now if it is able to grow now and slowly slowly the jute will degrade and maybe the long term the coil will degrade but vegetation actually the blades of grass the turfing and the roots are going to give you micro reinforcement so you can see the the sequence of events now first fundamentally we reduce the impact of the raindrop then we said reduce velocity of this raindrop and then we said more water is going to get into this now if we have got already seeds or seedlings done actually so these roots are going to grow more easily because the water is going to sweep through that now. And the blades of grass growing actually is also impeding the velocity. So you see that this becomes a natural way of trying to control this 
So that means actually we are going good turfing on the slope. That is what we call as biological engineering. So a lot of books are also available today. Uh, good books are available now. What is it we are trying to do? We made a slope appropriately. Okay, compacted soil. And over that we are going to place a roll and roll a roll actually. Now, in order that it doesn't move in the summer now, we have to also anchor it at the bottom and anchor it at the top now in a trench. Okay, so this is what we are going to do. So there are methods, there are methodology which is available now. In fact, a long back in year 2000 itself, we got I brought out a book uh, on core geotest sales. So all these are given in detail actually, also in the latest book uh, in 2016 released by the CVIP, even that is presented actually. So what we are trying to do is that we are going to place these rolls actually. Okay. And then uh, we are going to tie them across yeah. longitudinal and later also we are going to tie them. There is an overlap distance actually. So that is the tying up actually. These pins are there. And uh, we have got a standard practice of uh, how much overlap we are going to allow, how many pins we are going to use. So these are today's standards actually. And this has been done long back actually, probably near Ongol actually, between the highway between Ongol and uh, Kavali, I think. We have done this near one of the flyovers now. And uh, today it's got another flavor nest, so it's not seen. But what is it we've done is we got a trench at the top and we got a trench at the bottom now. The whole roll before it's being unrolled actually is being anchored right in this. We made a small pit actually, long channel pit, uh, parallel to the road. This is a road actually, and uh, this is slope basically. And what is it we have done? We did a trench actually about 30 centimeter wide and 45 centimeter deep now. And uh, this is uh, led into that now. And on the top, we are placing the soil and compact by rammed by hand only. And then it is taken down actually, and uh, again there will be a, an, um, a ditch at the bottom, so you can see it being unrolled actually. And then at the bottom ditch also, actually it's going to anchor. It's cut. West is cut now, and uh, naturally there's anchoring. So we got top anchoring, we got bottom anchoring, and uh, we've got these pins also, so that it doesn't move. So in this case, luckily there's no other horizontal joint actually. So this is what is the purpose of these uh, pins actually? To ensure that this material, this roll erosion control product, product that is RECP, is held onto the ground. There shouldn't be any space between this and the soil. Because otherwise, you know, what is going to come from the top and then get between the geotextile and uh, the soil and starts moving at the bottom now. So, till the vegetation is going to grow, obviously, we should try to see that this is um, anchored appropriately at the top and bottom by using the top ditch and bottom ditch. And also by suddenly fitting it by using U pins or any other many kinds of pins. In this case, we use uh, maybe six inches long and uh, three inches wide uh, pins. Uh, whatever is available to you, we can use it now. There's no problem of that now. So, this is the first use of this kind of uh, um, coir blanket, you can say, non woven coir blanket, which we call actually as RECP, is uh, done now. So, that was done, of course, uh, but like unluckily, um the nest uh, road uh, is compared to that now so that are not to be seen so we had also been given uh, free material actually by the kerala state Corp corporation for one of the major uh, approaches we have done um for the bridge by uh, the bridge across west of godavari at chinchinada and uh, in this case you know we had a uh, 20 to 25 meter thick black cotton soil and uh, it is a 12 meter high embankment we use a basil mattress we had a uh, reinforced soil at the, bottom, at the sides and then we also had a erosion control blanket in place of pitching that is what we are going to look at now so what we are going to do this is embankment now so on the sides actually the embankment is what we're talking about. we're not talking about these things you know that becomes another lecture so we are trying to we have designed the entire thing now this is the wall which we had on both sides when it is a high embankment embankment uh, on the dindi side other side that means getting into east Kravari is a 12 meter high and on the west Kodal side, which is Cincinnati, is a 10.5 meter high. And the embankment design based upon the soil available, silty soil. And uh, there is a basal mattress here now. There is a unrestrained mattress here now. And because we have space to continue with this uh, slope now, we have to place a, a wall at the edge now. The three meter high reinforced wall was placed. So anyway, so these are the berms which I had had. And the carriageway is 12 meter high, <coughs> 12 meter wide. So then same, same thing which I have shown you was done. Okay, you can see this uh, road approach. And then anchored at the, the sun now. And here, <coughs> the 
these people have approached the government has approached the local horticulture department they got seedlings of the right kind of uh, you can say turfing and they are planted on this now and we can see these plants small small plants actually and within three weeks you can see slowly slowly they start coming out you can see the land is so scarce you know almost as the bank bent we have obviously coconut groves and then paddy fields high water table and uh, naturally this is the end result now at the end of the monsoon period you can see completely this one now the point we are trying to make here is in those days this was uh, i think uh, around 2000 the year 2000 before that work started in 98 and uh, finished probably year 2000 year 2000 and uh, in those days the pitching here if you had put pitching for the same embankment it would have been costing about 120 rupees per square meter and instead of that now of course in this case the product came gratis to us but the material was costing in those days 40 rupees per square meter now so you can see per square meter we saved 80 rupees actually and also we see that the other side is road godavari how ugly you know a 10.5 meter embankment with the stone field kind of thing with pitching how ugly is going to be there and then of course also this is going in tune with respect to the coconut growth and then the paddy fields and there so it is always green yes in summer it may get dried up but doesn't matter because the uh, the rough, rough material is so good actually that when once the monsoon starts naturally again the leaves keep coming out actually and people because the ledge is here now people do quickly now actually on both sides we can think of this kind of thing so it's a beautiful area we have got actually and uh, <clears throat> These products today are in many kinds of ways. One is erosion control nettings, which are then erosion control meshes. Uh, one is a very weak one, and there is a stronger one. And then blankets I've shown you, double or triple net. And then these are the polymeric ones, which are not talking of today. So we got all these one, two, three varieties being made in the country. We don't have to import them. And uh, the fiber, of course, is our own fiber. And, usually, and the same way now. Uh, long back the garware ball rope company has also developed a, a kind of uh, mattress actually and you can see these are all waste actually cold waste and uh, through the made a slope now so on that they put about 250 centimeters of uh, um, sorry 250 millimeters of uh, normal soil good soil and then they place uh, the blanket ecb on this now and you can see how well the grass is going to grow on such kind of land also so you see this uh, success of this story of this now and uh, this is not something new in the sense that almost since 1940s, uh, at least the jute material was being used and export of our material also was there through America and Europe and all, but it was systematically done now. So we developed a methodology of how to do it now and did our own experiments in the initial state of Kerala. And then wherever they were using it, we tried to monitor them and go, arrived at a system by which we can design for different things. These are all mentioned actually in the book which was released as a 2016 uh, by the Central Board of Irrigation Power and the IGS India, uh, wherein all the details of experiments done, the elaborate experiments done now, the damage which can happen with different slopes and different kinds of soils, all that was executed. And today we have laboratories at CCRI, LIP, and also NCMRI, which is in Trivandrum. Uh, all of them are still continued with, of course, um, help from academicians. So then, of course, being a local product, and having a lot of soft soils in Kerala, what was thought was that why not we experiment it actually in trying to use it at least for rural roads. At least urban coir, we can use for rural roads. That's what was the concept. So one can also think of using this at the um, subgrade level actually, at the raw subgrade. So that means it between a separator between the subgrade and the sub base course. And is it working reinforcement or not is what we have to think of. Then we can also think of an edge drain. So we thought we can use this as a uh, cover actually uh, overlapping the, the drain but we didn't do any start with, study with this now but it's a possibility potential we are trying to talk so we try to experiment with this kind of thing through funding uh, given by the choir board actually and initially of course we did on our own we did laboratory studies and what was the initial reason for choosing this material the use of closely woven geotextile as an interface between subgrade and subbase increases the strength of the pavement now what do you understand the payment now? CBR value is very low. We are talking of CBR values up to around three only, and which really it's difficult to walk also. So if you are going to place this as a separator between the sub base and the soft soil now, it is going to increase the strength initially. And then of course, preventing intermingling, mixing of the soils, 
and of course the granules of base and it also helps in drainage you know so in course of time when the pavement is built up now after the road, road to begin with you know so when once you make the road now slowly slowly the traffic is going to pick up when once the traffic is picking up now after all the water table is generally at the top very near the ground level only so in these cases you now as the load is developing the traffic what will happen is there will be pore pressure excess pore water pressure developed in the soft soil so the excess pore water pressure can release it through the layer of geotextile into the slowly slowly if the traffic development is um, kind of uh, going slowly initially the seabed value because of the loss of water into the drainage layer is going to help us in improving the CPR. It becomes stronger naturally. So what is happening now? There are two procedures. One step, of course, is that it is helping initially strengthen the pavement now to take care of the first few months of first one year of traffic development. And in this time now, the excess water pressure is dissipated. So the soil becomes more, more consolidated. And so the CPR value improves to from whatever it was there to higher value. This can be also studied. This has been studied also uh, by us at uh, College of Engineering to enter to the project. So once the core is placed on the weak subgrade, the subgrade stiffens and becomes stronger on consolidation within about a year or so under the action of the granular subbase such as the self-weight repayment, construction rolling, and traffic loads. So this was the initial conjecture, which we thought are doing it. And then with the time, the subgrade becomes less and less dependent on the fabric for its stability. Therefore, the long-term durability aspect of coir should not deter its use as geotextile for various applications in, in road construction. So this is the crux of the whole thing now. What is it we are claiming is, in the beginning, the rural road traffic will develop slowly. So during this period, the soil is going to, subsoil is going to consolidate, subgrade is going to consolidate. And once it consolidates now, naturally, the role of geotextile is over actually. Because suppose we thought we started with the CBR of 2 now, it may become 2.25, it may become 2.5, it may become 3. So, upon many things now, if the CBR is going to improve now, naturally, when the improvement is occurred completely, even if the geotextile cause the stress degrades, it doesn't matter to us. But then we find that even after a few years also, this is not occurred actually. That is lucky part of it. So, before these field studies are taken up, we did a lot of studies. As I told you, this award winning paper by the uh, I, I see actually general journal which we got long back, I think 2008 we got the award. We did a lot of studies in using the clay and many kinds of things and top sand and did cyclic and static uh, testing extensively actually. And that shown very clearly that both the non-woven geotextile, that is the blanket and the woven geotextiles, the coil ones, are working as good as actually the synthetic ones in improvement. So subsequently, more recently, uh, maybe by 2012 or something like that now, work was done uh, by MVS Razor, who got a PhD on the subject now. He did also, again, a different kind of study, wherein we used actually a lot of systems to measure what is happening and compared, of course, in this case, the base material is going to be the fly ash now in this case. Earlier it was with a different kind of clays, now it is fly ash from Ramagundam. And then uh, we also use actually coir geotextile, we also use a normal woven geotextile, we also use the synthetic grid actually. So we're using all the three things now. We have a lot of information on the, uh, we can say strains which are there and on the modules which is there now. So we find that yes, they are working very well now, but they'll work better if you got a stiffer geo style. Otherwise, it is a low modulus of the material which I've shown you, um, was not very, not very good compared to a synthetic one. That is impeding further use of this now. Today, if we are able to get a better quality, let's say, uh, core uh, rope, from there we can make a core geotextile, and that will help us in trying to make a better behavior now. So, conclusions are that the core geotextile has potential to serve the reinforcement function in frictional material like pond ash, because pond ash is very good. However, the low modulus of the CGD core geotextile, and hence the pond ash plus core geotextile composite is resulting in higher level of strain than allowable both under static and track loading. So that has to improve. So that is what is happening now. Otherwise, it is comparable with respect to synthetic ones. So then a lot of studies, as I said, has been done by Coir Board and the um, NCMRI, which is a Kerala government undertaking, uh, Institute actually for Research and Management and Coir. 
and uh, they did a lot of studies actually uh, in the soft soil areas of Canada. And I told you further work was also done by the Samson Machu of NIT. Today he's director of NATPAC in Canada. So this is what we have done actually. Uh, just show you some of the laying and things like this now. So by all these actual studies, what is it we find is that we find that the improvement is something permanent. The subgrade is going to improve. And uh, so we made recommendations ultimately through the studies essentially of uh, NIT uh, Trichy. It was accepted in the recent meeting of the Highway Service Standards Committee of the IRC. And hopefully within a few months now, it will be coming out as a publication, self publication of the IRC. So that is the story of uh, um, the core material and its use in erosion control, which is, of course, uh, earlier also there, but we made it a, a standard product and understood much better the intricacies of that. And then we experimented in the field and the laboratory on geotest cells, both oven and non oven also. I, I didn't uh, emphasize on the non oven part of it because for lack of time. But both studies have been done. And finally, it has come into a stage wherein there are good standards and guidelines available from the country's standards organizations, IRC and BIS. So in the same kind of thing has been done with respect to the material. So we are going to talk of geotextile. When you try to talk of geotextile, trying to look at is the jute has got properties which are different, of course, from synthetics anyway. But then you'll be surprised to find that if you look at the jute and then polyester and polypropylene, you look at the strength, the unit is slightly different, you may not understand, but it is a representative strength. And essential break now, and the more initial modules now, you find that jute, polyester, polypropylene, basically all of them have got the same kind of strength as a fiber. Essential break actually is very small, 1 to 1.8. And this is actually higher. That means better engineering material. So because of this now, it gives you higher modules also. That means the unweathered, that means fresh jute actually has got better engine properties than the synthetic material actually. So that is something you have to remember now. So using this now initially, uh, through my colleague, uh, Professor B.K. Banerjee at uh, IIT Delhi, and uh, our student, Mava Ghosh, now a lot of studies have been done actually because of eco-friendly fiber. And uh, we have got, of course, plenty of the fiber available in India and Bangladesh. And uh, so our work actually has developed into finally trying to understand the injury behavior of jute in isolation and within soil. And then we studied the biodegradability of jute now. And we got a product also developed. We'll see that now. And uh, of course, even much earlier than that, also IJIRA, the Indian Jute Nurses Association Laboratories, and the National Jute Board, Calcutta, have been funding many studies internationally and nationally also. Along with Dhaka, they were trying to do studies now, a lot of field studies, product development, and which we'll see quickly. So in the beginning, this material was being made probably uh, before independence by a company called uh, Ludlow Jute Mills, called Open View Jute Geotestile. The interesting part of it is actually that this is not fresh jute. You know, jute is a plant, Zanu, Zanu plant, this we don't know. So he plant ninji. We take out the fiber part of it, the has part of it actually, and that we rot it for a few weeks in water, and then we get the fiber now. So people in Skakula area are very, very familiar with this. A lot of jute mills are there now. So from that we extract actually the good fiber for other products now. Whatever is waste jute, that is called caddies. This is lying waste outside now. So mixing some of the good fiber with this waste jute now. That's why you see this a lot of diameter. They're not specific. It's not a cloth. This is called open weave jute now. So this material has been developed now because it has got the potential to degrade faster. That is the important point. Is you know, hardly any um, material is there in this now. So you find that it is open weave jute geotestile. This is being made uh, before independence now, exported to both America and uh, England and of course uh, Europe also. And a uh, lot of studies have been done in India also. Subsequently, you can see mine spots. You can wear in the material is spread here actually, and then you can see another figure wherein uh, the the grass or whatever it is, the turfing is going to grow slowly, and uh, naturally it has been found to be good. But then naturally the growth of the vegetation depends on many things basically. The other study 
for the NHBC work actually. You can see how this is being spread actually and uh, how to protect the slope and all. So there have been studies and studies actually, uh, most supported by the government now and uh, quite a success initially. But unfortunately, what was happening was they tried to say as though it is going to be a slope civilization technique. It is not a slope civilization technique, it is only surface erosion control technique. So in areas wherein the overall slope is unstable actually, by pressing this material on the surface, it is not going to improve the stability, it is going to improve the surface characteristics. It is not going to improve, I mean, it is going to improve only from the erosion of the particles on surface. So whether it be hill slope, whether it is going to be a highway slope or a railway slope actually, railway line slope, it can be done perfectly. So a lot of studies are there, I do not want to venture into this in detail. But then there are success stories on this now. It is a common material we exported now. Today we got material of a good jute also. Many products are developed also by the IJIRA, and we'll see if time permits on this now. So what all we also thought was, why not we also make, using the natural fibers, a what we call as a prefabricated vertical drain. Now the prefabricated vertical drain, uh, very recently, very recently means uh, a decade back probably, uh, we use also in developing Visa Patnam uh, airport also. Before that, uh, such a drains have been used in uh, Gakinara port also. And uh, we have this PVD, which is consisting of, uh, it's like a tape-like material. Uh, and it's got a core of um, some kind of plastic. And then a sleeve of an oven geotextile. So the central portion, actually, the core is something which allows water to go through. And the cover portion is going to give a filter now. So this entire thing is pushed into the ground. When once you push in the ground, actually, and what is going to happen now? The soft soil, which is there now, wherein with high pore water pressure, so the water part of it will be coming into the central core portion, and then through the natural drainage portion, it will go up, depending on the pore water pressure, or into the bottom uh, drainage layer, actually, of the natural soil. So that is the way in which PVDs are there. And lakhs and lakhs meters of PVDs are being used, actually, in quite a few projects in India. It's a common technique now. So seeing the success of these uh, synthetic PVDs, what was thought was that why not to develop a natural fiber PVD also. So a lot of work has been done at IIT Delhi, uh, studying and developing many kind of products now. It was limited to laboratory studies, obviously. And also a technique was developed by which uh, I can show that uh, later, uh, this, the, how the um, sample is prepared actually in the lab using jute and coir. We'll come to that later. Simultaneously, actually, we also developed a jute-based asphalt overlay product now. That means, can we use it in the uh, pavement layers? Till now, what we talked, we talked about separate improvement only. A separator as a drain and to improve the wear capacity or improve the pavement behavior um, of soft soils. But now, we have to look at its use in a overlay fabric. That means, is a bituminous layer, actually. So, this, as I said, was done by Dr. Mahabha Ghosh and with uh, collaboration from Professor Banerjee. So, this is the kind of product which you think of this rail side of it now, and the other side is something like this one. This is the uh, what we call as a special VVZ pattern developed based upon the aggregate particle distribution. To in order that there is a proper uh, interlocking between the this material and the uh, stones actually, which is consisting of the asphalt well layers now. So this is made by using what we call as a Lino wave technique, Lino L E and O Lino wave technique. So that is developed specially, and. Uh, this is how uh, further uh, this one is there. So this binding is done such a way that this aperture is available for interlocking with the uh, system. And of course, this is coated with this, uh, bitumen. And uh, it is studied in great detail, actually. Uh, payment model is done, actually. And then a reflective drag propagation is done. And a cycle loading is done now. How it is going to behave uh, when, uh, when you impregnate with uh, bitumen. And how it is going to behave when once you put uh, the business layers at the top and bottom now, all of them has done now how to really retard the trap propagation, the further movement of the uh, cracks to the top layer. So all this is done now. So that was uh, a product which we developed at IIT Delhi. And more recently, a few years back actually, a lot of studies were done on how to improve the characteristics of the jute material. Uh, because if you want to use it in a road kind of, see, if you want to use it in biodegradable stabilization, Naturally, the work is done when once the vegetation is going to grow. In the biodegradable part of it now, once turfing is going to go on, naturally, the disappears completely. It vanishes. And it becomes actually manure for the plants to grow better. That is what we thought. But when once we want to use in roads now, like in coir, naturally, we need a slightly longer life now. 
So for this now, we took three soils at Ijira through a project sponsored by the Ministry of Textiles. Uh, and actually, it is a center of technical textiles, center of Jujo textiles in India at the Ijira. So, what is it we have done is we have done actually taken three kinds of soils. One is, of course, Calcutta soil, which we call as alluvial Calcutta silty soil. Another is what we take now from Gohati, uh, lightweight soils, red soil. And another one we have taken from Thadipal Gudam, and the British black cotton soil. So, if you want to look at that, actually, the classification is going to be this is essentially. Uh, sand, well, silty clay, that means, you know, you see that sand percent is 69 percent, silty is 20 percent, clay is 11 percent, so it is sand, actually, it's silty clay is sand. Okay, in the case of Calcutta local soil, again, we find that the, the silty is 65 percent, the clay is 25 percent, and, of course, sand is 10 percent, so it is actually basically silty material. It is clay, sand is silt. And the Tharpurikotam black on soil, actually, has got 59 percent of clay, and 98% silt and sand 22%. It is taken from the field actually. So it is sandy, silty clay. So you can see this kind of sand, this kind of silt, and this kind of clay. And uh, the liquid limit of this, the PI, of course, obviously, black on soil is high, 35. And then sand, I mean, the Calcutta soil is 10. And here is 12. There's not much difference in the liquid properties of this except the particle well, distribution. So only our black on soil is different, way different. No? So just look at quickly. What is the characteristics we are going to find out of this? Just deterioration, degradation. So what is the degradation? It's strength now. A lot of studies have been done actually, cycle loading for almost two years now, thousand cycles now. So that work I'm not reporting. It's reported in the journals now. So I'm only looking at actually the black and soil work now. So what is the reduction in the strength we're looking at now? You can see this material, our material without any treatment. That means what we call the gray due to the cell has within six months completely gone. 0% strength. And you can mix now this jute with also synthetic fiber. That's what we have done. With the PP, 20% uh, PP, we mix the fiber, actually made a yarn, and that is what is studied now. You see this, the degradation is hardly, in uh, eight, nine months' time, is hardly 10 to 15%, or 20%, you can see this. And whereas, we also got actually a special uh, material, <coughs> Which is uh, also treated, not put treating, so that was behaving somewhere in between. If you look at the material like over the soil now, so the the degradation is not so much at all. It is there, of course, six months it degrades, but then in the case of Calcutta soil, which has got more silt actually, we treated it. There's a rot proof technique which is developed by Ijira. That means they got a special protocol for a kind of chemical, and before coming out of factory, it was treated with that now. So by that process now. The degradation reduced to this much. You know, that means no degradation. So the no treatment, the treatment for Gohati soil, treatment, raw root treatment for Calcutta soil, and treating with the blended material is another kind of thing which are done. So with this now, a lot of work has been done in the laboratory. Uh, degradation is done uh, studied extensively. So that is what is easier synthetic material for black cotton soil, and uh, other things we have done actually systematically. And uh, also now field studies are going on at uh, Manipur actually, and in for uh, near in for that means 50 to 100 kilometers. That field studies are going on, and we have, we have developed procedures by which it can be laid appropriately. And mind you, even before all this has happened, also the NJB has ensured that these have become part of the documentation by BAS also and IRC also. So a lot of documents are available. Some of the papers which we have done we have published in great detail now recently. And uh, so the work has come to a, a much higher level of implementation also. And uh, so what is it we find actually? We find that using such natural materials for stabilizing the rural roads to begin with now, what is it we main condition is? It will be poor soil. That means soft subdate. We can say the strength less than 100 kPa, okay, C value, uh, coefficient value, and CBR less than 2. That means the soil is usually clay sand or clay silt and or organic fatty clay. And water table near the ground surface, and seasonally wet subgrade, and high sensitive soil. So these are the typical conditions which which require actually an improvement subgrade. And this improvement can be done by using natural geotextiles. Of course, it will be done also by synthetic geotextiles. So what is being approved in the in the ministry's uh, not ministry's IRC's documentation for coir now is that it becomes a rural road material. Now. The rural road can be designed using the coir material. Let us say. And jute kato palace, even earlier also jute is already recognized actually. So what also is happening is 
that the normal rural loads are done for a few MSA, that means two to five MSA, that means million standard access. But the director of NRDA has gone into, gone in straight, gone to state that now the traffic rules and 10 MSA, 10 million standard access, or even 25 million standard access. So that means they have to, in rules also, they have to start using geosynthetics, either a synthetic material, or it could be a coir, or it could be jute if it's brewing there now. So these materials are now approaching actually not just highways, it's approaching also naturally the, <coughs> the rural roads also, without which we can't help. And then by this process, naturally, we are going to influence the uh, industry also, influence the cottage industry, influence the people who do farming for this now. And uh, we are trading labor also, upon, and labor, uh, good kind of work for roads is also there. And at the same time, I want to also just mention out of context that last year, that is in 2019, uh, the IRS brought out a document for use of geosynthetics in highways called SP59. Now that deals with geo cells and geo grids actually, which are of course much stronger than our materials now for use in highways. That means uh, uh, spaceways, uh, uh, national highways, and state highways can use them effectively. Uh, so that document is already there now. So with the MORD going on for with collaboration with IRC to bring out the manuals for both jute and coir, I think we are in a pedestal wherein we can start using it effectively. And uh, I want, want to repeat also, these are not textbook materials. That means the subject is not taught in engineering normally. And also we find that the use comes out with by experience, you know, initially we have to try something new. So that is where we come into picture. So this is what I was mentioning, uh, the sketch is misplaced. So we developed a, a kind of PVD now, wherein the casing, earlier was a geocentric, a non geo was used for the casing now. Here we use a casing made of braiding the jute yarns actually. And the central core, which is a plastic material earlier, now we got coil ropes actually. So for this, we developed a machine, for the Banerjee developed a machine at IIT Delhi. And by this process now, the central portion coil is going up now. The weaving is done actually by this um, continuous movement of this now. And so we got coir M core, which allows water to go through. And uh, the braided uh, fabric sheath is, of course, is the filter material. And uh, so this is called a breakout drain. And there are many other kind of drains people have developed. They also put a jute cloth, actually. And then at the center, we can place, uh, again, uh, coir ropes, or we can also place a non oven kind of uh, medium. So there are many products that are being developed now. But still, I can, I'm, unfortunately, these are not being uh, tried in the field. But there's no reason why it don't work. But there's a difference is going to be that these are definitely heavier and thicker than the synthetic ones. So placement of them also means that when once you are pushing a thicker material to the ground now, there will be some disturbance. There will also disturbance the sort all around actually. So these difficulties will be there, but then I'm sure that this will be working effectively because once the consolidation of the soil soft soil is over now, naturally it degrades as a matter of us now. So that is a natural way of doing it. So to understand all of them now, to conclude what we are trying to say, first of all, the natural fiber geotextiles are totally environment friendly and it is some sustainable technology. It has got higher growth potential and obviously, of course, it is environment friendly in any way you want to do it now and accepted by the Indian Road Congress for rural roads and standards by the Bureau of Finance standards for roads and road control and it boosts the traditional, you can say, cottage industry or rural industry and uh, particularly people of uh, Srikakulam should be very happy and people in the coastal area should be very happy because they have uh, these things now and people in the Anandpur and Kadapati streets naturally they can also get material from Karnataka also. A lot of things are there uh, which are done now. So that way it becomes a, a system of using and helping our, our own people around the country, helping the industry, helping the farmers and then having a better quality structures, better quality infrastructure. That is what we are trying to look at. So when you're trying to look at that now, so what we're trying to say is that we are saying the same standard in, uh, in, uh, in Sanskrit now, let all people be happy and content. And then may the entire universe live in harmony. I think that is the ultimate motive of taking this work now, because the earth we have been given, obviously for our own needs and greed, we are doing a lot of things now. But using these natural fibers is not doing it because it is a renewable resource. In a way, it is waste material actually. People are not using it effectively. So we conclude by saying that let all people be happy and content. 
and may the entire universe live in harmony. That is the motto of this. Thank you very much. So, any questions, any clarifications? So, what was the chart box? Okay. Look, questions, sir. Chart box, no, sir. Bombay Beach Kaneshmara. Yella protect chest to Naru and Adiya. Bombay Beach, na. Uh, actually, I have no clue on that at the moment. How do, how do uh, I do what methods used at Bombay Beach to protect the city of Bombay and Petteri? I don't know really. I don't think they are doing anything specially, but I am not aware of it. Geo synthetic the, the, the normal, no no the normal way of doing is by doing tetrapods and stones and all that is the common way i think they are doing the same thing except some limited stretches varying the instruments but uh, to be very frank i am not conversant with that area geo synthetics involve a lot of members to be placed at sea coast it involves a lot of lot of cost how can we prefer sorry sorry say it again geo synthetics so involve a lot of members to be placed at a sea coast. Uh, it involves a lot of cost and adultinarism. Well, we are trying to say this is cheaper technology, the cheapest and long-standing technology. After all, ultimately, when you choose a technology, it has to be cost effective. And it has to be I never are and undi katsara I unmute chestara, I in adultaru, and I in a doubt end. Yeah. Uh, uh, Rishi Ansari. Rishi. Rishi Ansari. Uh, by using Geonex, will it affect aquatic animals? I am Rishi Ansari. I am going to ask you to unmute your Sir, clarified, sir. Hello. Uh, sir, clarified, sir. Wusha Gutala, sir. Geo Pectin, you chade in the aquatic animals came and I effect on Tina and Adutinel. See, the point is that. Um, I don't think we have any studies done on that, but I don't think it will affect the aquatic uh, this one now. They are affected by many other things now. Because this is, a, this is something which is, uh, uh, if you're talking of synthetics now, obviously they are, uh, what you call as, they are durable. They are not affected by acids and alkalis. They don't, uh, what you call, uh, degrade actually. Isn't it? By salt water also, by any water, they don't degrade themselves. Okay. Then regarding the natural flower materials, they are degraded materials anyway. So the question of, uh, it's like, uh, let's say any leaves get degraded now. Are they affecting the uh, fishes and things? No. There's no chemical in that now. Is a 100% natural material. If it gets degraded, nothing is going to happen. It becomes, it becomes a mulch and then it will be allowing uh, vegetation to grow. So both ways, I don't see an effect of this now. Okay. We are not trying to change environment by this. You know, We are only trying to control the loss of soil for us, loss of land for us. That is the main thing. And if you look at the total content of water flowing, see, we are only supporting the surface of the bank, is it not? What is the volume of uh, exposure to compare to the volume of water which is going to be there? Nothing, actually. So you should think on a total terms, you know. Anyway, even then also, the surface of this material is not what you call as uh, decomposing. It's not degrading. If it's degrading like natural fibers, naturally it becomes a mulch. And it uh, mixes with water, that's it. And it becomes uh, probably manure or it becomes uh, food for aquatic uh, animals also, or fish or whatever it is. That is my feeling. Tadi Poina Murali Sai Krishna, engineering assistant, Pollu Rutesa. She 
piling or the sheet or construction of wall pile which is better sir me question mere adugutara sir tanja vaina murali sai krishna garu जर डिस्मेंटल इपू षी पैलिंग फुल लेंथ षी ड्रैव अव्वकुवल एक्सटेट वरक अभी दाक मन वाल पैल वेक वाल पैल वेल्लन कलरे एग्जिस्ट पैल्स उ पैल रेस्ट स्ट्रेन वस्तानी अना सर का वालू षी पैलिंग के वेलर सर एंटे मैं डिजन अलागे अभी अर्थ कल सर अभी कुछ एक्सप्लेन सर दिशन sir you are deviating from the subject of my presentation <laughs> okay sir but i have this doubt sir Could no no but this you have to send more in detail just you were saying is uh, these people have got my email id okay sir okay or you can note on gvrao.19 at gmail gvrao.19 okay sir at gmail.com okay you send some detail okay, often you know by statements i can't uh, make any comment i can make a comment or explain to you what is situation okay sure sir thank you sir that can be done no problem okay yeah anybody else ravindra how do i go back to normal this one uh screen on the blue yes uh stop sharing and all sir fine at top no problem okay then this is okay okay was not so sir okay sorry yeah pay kar lena no aaya aaya sir yes sir yeah yeah okay adi i saw the aspect tool bar to the bottom kada i didn't aspect it at the top koni ah yes sorry sir i forgot that okay chapandi somebody else where we implemented other than upara to protect the road embankment huh? yeah yeah embankment as well as uh, uh, see ultimately there is always a bank you know like uh, penta beach also i've shown you there is a bank like that. in many cases too so i only picked up something near our towers actually because it gives conference you can go and see what is happening you can observe there that's why i talk of examples nearby whatever if it is done nearby okay so the the final thing which everybody has to remember is going to be that there are these solutions which are available which have proved successful isn't it so one has to go and visit the site get some data on that and then i uh, try to uh, understand and then learn more of it because quite a bit of information is also available freely oh, yeah uh, professor raw garu of course one yes. very outlandish question from we check point yeah you see there is this uh, flow of water from the flyover which is really hyderabad when we that's mm-hmm. now uh, flyover there's been a lot of discussion in the ias group about this flyover today i i just was wanting to know i mean if, if you have an idea i know it's very unfair to ask me ask this question do you think it's part of a design or it's just the uh, water uh, rainfall exceeding the design discharge no uh, actually i have not seen uh, uh, there, are, have... there are a lot of videos doing the circulation saying that this is a waterfall from pv narsimara and most of them in a very derisive manner uh, reporting that i don't think that's true because i understand that the city of hyderabad is designed for a discharge of about just 20 mm of water rainfall per hour whereas the rainfall received on that particular day was 120 per hour mm. so i think these are bound to happen uh allied to that mm. is the question are we making use of these membranes in 
in urban areas for flyovers, for roads, etc. Sir, we are always using technology, but partially. Uh -huh. The point is that now, suppose uh, you were you were in the government. I was not in the government. I was accommodation always. But the point is that now, supposing somebody makes an estimate of 125 crores, you have let us say funding of 80 crores only. Then you always try to say that no, no, why it's not immediate, it's not urgent. Let us do in the second phase or something else, something else. Now, right. so this you know, this is not cutting corners, but then cutting uh, the bridge. So certain features yeah. actually are not uh, are not adopted properly. Uh, like this now, supposing we don't have vents for the water to be taken out now. I mean, you see the embankments mostly not necessarily in the city outside now. And the water is simply going down. Uh, there are vents already there. There are uh, we call, uh, drains which are there on surface also, but they are sunk completely. But whereas the examples I have taken actually for you is a total success without any dynamic success and you know? all. Isn't it? So the point I always mentioned to you, sir, and also to others is that we have to change our guidelines actually as per the product. product uh, Systems are available, and as per our experience, also up there. This is not done. Everybody looks at either the old structure which is built or looks at a consultant who will do the needful. I fully agree, sir. Our consultant see, is not. Particularly, particularly in the problem, isn't it? He says. Uh, Hello, can you go ahead? Go ahead. So, uh, so the the engineer at the side is uh, not able to understand because he's not weightage at all. He says, "No, you are only doing construction explanation now." So they are eager to understand. Your engineer could understand quite a few of them are MTEX also, but at the level actually they are there, they are simply brushed off. So that should not happen actually. For those who are interested in learning more, the practicing more, let us say, we should have more of these activities so that they understand the value of whatever we are trying to say. And then adopt it also. So in this case, you are right. If the design uh, decides, I mean, if the design rainfall is some amount, and then if it is going to be three times, four times higher now, no system is going to work. Obviously, now people can ask. Yeah, that's okay. You know, during his time, and why it's not happening now, and all these things becomes politically uh, masquerading and different things now. So that's why I don't believe these statements also. Some of them can be very good, work. some of them are not. For example, uh, when I recently, you know, one year back, uh, maybe not one year, maybe six months back, uh, maybe Jan, Jan only, uh, there was an issue in uh, in the airport now. Okay, and that issue has come of the design only of approach, you know, the AP approach they are making, they were making those days, I think it was finished now. So the point is that there's a lot of water there, it's a low lying area. Water has come because of rainfall. When they got some company to investigate this, he says the water table is six meters below the ground. Right? The problem has come only because water is there at the ground level. It's a low lying area. Rainfall has occurred. But the report they got from some company is saying that whatever is below. And it's all sandy area. Right? It's, it's, the machines are unable to move now. The, uh, the JCB is unable to move now. That is what is the status of the country. I said, how come it's coming now? So, what are the money? They simply provide a report and get away. So all your consultants are behaving to the government also is like that only because they're not transfer technology to the engineers. Now sometimes the engineers are not ready to understand this also. There's a kind of confusion, let us say, to say the least now. So the upgradation of the skill, which ABR which are doing, I, I enjoy that. I appreciate that. Whatever efforts you have done now, we have to bring our own people's technology to higher levels. At least you are giving an appreciation. But it has to come convert into the change of manuals and guidance, things like that. That's what uh, Dr. Oswald and we were talking always, you know. He says, we need a document now. No? Who's going to prepare it? It takes time. It needs resources also. With no, with no resources now, go to Dr. Oswald and me or you can do it now. Some resources have to provide it now. See, sir, this is what I'm talking of uh, erosion control now. How much the government of India and state are spending money on flood relief? How much you are spending on coastal uh, flood relief, actually? Now, if you just put this, the, the disaster management authority, then this force and this and that, and then shifting people now, giving them uh, maybe poles, giving them cloth, giving them food now. How much are spending now? If you just couple this for three years now, I can give you permanent solution, which is implemented by the country, by the state, by the country, by the organization. No, they are not interested in doing it now. That is politics. They would rather have it every year happening. After all, every year, we have, we have, uh, the outskirts are getting affected now. Are we thinking about the solution for that now? I am sorry to say this. So the country has no time to spend on what we want, actually. It keeps doing whatever they feel like, you know. They're arresting people uh, every now and then, and because I said something. So the point is that 
this technology which we are trying to transfer is very important many people are working on the under platform but for it to come to the assistant level we need to do something more than this uh, i fully agree with you sir that uh, as part of disaster management we need to document some of these things and uh, unfortunately very rightly pointed out by you we the senior functionaries do not have time i think it's all uh, hit and run uh, whenever there is an emergency <laughs> uh, uh, i particularly organizations like the ndma national disaster management authority and the state disaster management authorities will have to reflect on this and then take uh, this into as as a part of the and integrated into the part of the functioning of each department unfortunately we don't even have a training institution for the engineers in different states including ap yes, i was sir. trying to i was trying to fill up that gap to some extent but it's not possible always you know uh, to be, to catch catch up with the best of what's happening in the world i i fully agree with you and i really appreciate the kind of presentation you are making sir and we'll certainly try to see whatever we can <laughs> thank you sir thank you thank you thank you very sir, much sir desre desre manas garu ta unmute cheyandi sir madam edo question adugutara ta i think we should close in another 2 3 minutes it's already more than 2 hours yeah can we update <laughs> hello somebody has unmuted please <laughs> Huh. Sir, my question is: uh, You told that we can use uh, courier fiber uh, for reinforcement also. Mm, uh, I, didn't, and... I didn't say. That. Sir, you have road, 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 road. We can't huh, use for road, road, road. Like in a wall, no. Huh. Yes, sir. For a wall, but the tendon strength is less, no, sir. How can we use it for roads? No, no. I am saying rural road. I think please don't confuse. For rural road on CBR with less now you can't build a normal road. Supposing you want to build, a, suppose CBR one or something means you can't walk through it also. Now, okay, you are going to lose aggregate into the soft soil. Is it not? Your mixing is there now. Compressor yes, pressure is going to develop now. So for that now to enable construction, we are pressing the air, which is a some extent in the initial stages only. Okay. In course of time, it's going to improve. I have made a detailed uh, explanation to that now. So only for the temporary stage, we are going to use it like a reinforcement, just to see that it is not mixing, it is allowing pore pressure dissipation, and then serving the initial traffic. After okay, you have payment layer now, that is going to allow consolidation anyway now, is it not? So okay, most consolidation is going to take place by the excess pore pressure generated by the traffic, by the pore pressure generated by the uh, overlying payment layer now. So the improvement and the severe is going to be there. So till that improvement is occurring, it is working temporarily like reinforcement. Okay. okay, that is why okay. I said we are so low. I made it a point to say that it is so low actually. Yes, sir. And that is why we can't use it at all. Okay, sir. Thank you. Sir, so last question: the why government has not taking these techniques, even though these are come under less cost? You are asking me the question. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm working on this since ninety, since eighty-five. Yeah, yeah. I belong to the engineers of the state. You, Supposing uh, the Chinchinada is done not by me, by the engineers of the state. There's only one example, and I have done so much in Andhra Pradesh. It is done by the government only. I can't build a bridge, Hena. Huh? Only government build a bridge. So that is not coming to practice. That's what I'm saying. There are cases which have been done by the state also. Srikakulam is a hub for making jute. There was a proposal you know, to make a center of excellence, whatever it is, you know, the, I don't know what you call the different kind of centers and all. The lot of work is all uh, the, the core fiber is being brought out in the districts of uh, I know very well, Eastern West Gudavari and Guntur and Agres also. Why we are not using the same ropes? It's not a rocket science technology. It is somebody in the government level who has to do this. Now government means now in this case, government is CM now, is it not? Or somebody else like that. Government is not Chakrapani Sab. He was in the government also, but then it is guided by the instruction from the top only, isn't it? Whereas I am an independent uh, um, fellow in the sense that I am a teacher. So if I am asked, I will tell you what is the answer for that. But to bend is going to be on people like Chakravani Sahab or uh, Bhavan Rao or Rajiv. Okay, sir. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
isn't it? So uh, there is, you see, there is a there is a way in which we propagate technology, isn't it? So I am just bringing to your attention that this is not a high level technology, low level technology only. You should make it your effort. Do that now. Now you see uh, one point, sir. The monastery now at least about thousand people have listened to Mr. Rao today, Professor Rao. They know that this technology is there. They have also seen, as he said, here some at least can is of five six places low. Then you break into the You multiply that. See, instead of saying that your government lo jail, your jail, manavi jail. I don't think any political master will say no. Once we are convinced of this and then try to spread it, it should become part of your own standard schedule of rates. It should become part of the whole sensitization process of middle engineers, as rightly said by Professor Rao. If all your knowledge and professional skill is outsourced to consultants, you will never develop your capacity. This is the point I have repeatedly made in the meetings of secretaries in pre, uh, and even in the presence of the chief secretary. The source, role of the consultant will have to be limited to very few things. The design capabilities of departments will have to increase. There should be a design wing in each district at the district level in each department. There should be an engineering college, engineering training college at the state level. It should have regional centers. I have suggested earlier that at Polavaram, we should start something like voluntary because we have some infrastructure there. It's an excellent location for the next five to 10 years. So I that should have been set up as part of the uh, disaster risk reduction project, which is funded by the World Bank. So these are all issues on which every individual should feel. And since you are all youngsters, I'm glad that there are youngsters today, a large number of them, they should now exert whatever little influence or whatever little knowledge they have, start working, start looking at these alternatives so that uh, it, it becomes integrated into our professional functioning on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you very much, sir. Please, uh, Bhartikar, propose a word of thanks. Ah, sir.